All right, I think we will go ahead and get started. Um, thank you all for being here today. Um, and I just, uh, my name is Dana Harganani and I'm the Child Health Director for the Oregon Health Authority. I've been asked to co-chair this um, committee. I serve on the Early Learning Council um, <coughs> with other colleagues as well. And I just wanted to maybe see, John, I'm gonna put you on the spot. Did you wanna share any opening remarks? Um, no, I just, just a couple. I wanted to say thank you very much to everyone for taking the time to do this. Um, the early learning data system has been something that we have had um, long before I got to the state of Oregon, and I think what we're now looking at is how is it that we fit in with other work that's being done, how is it going to work with the OEIB um, recent legislation. So thank you for giving up your time because we know how important it is for the kids and families we serve to be able to have um, good data and good outcomes to work with. So we're all excited about the learning problems. And I too, I want to thank you. Um, we got this meeting pulled together rather quickly on some complicated schedules and summer vacations. So I'm thrilled that we I think we have all but one person here for our uh, committee as soon as our co-chair is able to join us. Um, what I wanted to do is just briefly um, reference our charter, um, make sure you know why we're here. Um, I'm gonna really just do that briefly and then open it up to introductions and I think it will be more helpful to come back to the charter after we do some kind of background information um, on the early childhood data system and the statewide longitudinal data system and then we can come back to further digest our charter, <laughs> which I think will be helpful. Um, but I will go ahead and um, draw your attention to our charter, which is in your packet, and specifically on the second page, so you can just have these in the back of your mind. So we are formally the Early Learning Council, Early Childhood Data System Steering Committee, and I will have a prize for anybody who comes up with a better, <laughs> easier term than that. I've kept it pretty literal at this time, um, so that people kind of get us started and we understand what our role is, um, but I, I think that we could find a better way to at least quickly reference it um, internally. Um, so that is who we are, and <clears throat> we um, have a cross-representation, which you're gonna hear about, um, across agencies and sectors. Um, and so I'm just going to point out our major deliverables, and one of the immediate purposes why I pulled us all together is we have some uh, business that needs to be adjusted quickly, and you'll be hearing a little bit later about our home visiting data system, and specifically we need to synthesize where things are with our home visiting data system development and how that fits in with the early childhood data system. So that's really our urgent task for today that I really hope that we have some recommendations or move forward um, after today. But for the broader scope of work, um, our job is to develop guidance on integration of the early childhood data system with the statewide longitudinal data system um, and um, identify what other resources and next steps are needed to carry forth our real legislative charge. Um, and really our job is to understand and figure out a work plan for what the function is of our steering committee moving forward. So it's gonna feel possibly a little bit out of order that we're gonna jump into the second half of our meeting today, the home visiting data system, but it's because it comes with a pretty specific timeline. Um, and then we're gonna kind of regroup at our next meeting for any other urgent issues that we need to address as well as thinking broader about the scope of our work. Any questions? I know there will be many. I mean, the substance of it, maybe we, can, we will certainly come back to after we do introductions and get a little bit more background, but any burning questions just about why we're here today <laughs> to start us off? Okay, so I'd like to uh, start with introductions, and I'll just, I did introduce um, generally my title, but I just want to share a little bit more information. My background is as a general pediatrician. I still do clinical care and in fact was in clinic this morning, so my brain is still trying to revert over to <laughs> this role. <laughs> so if I throw in some medical terms, that's probably why. Um, and I came to the Oregon Health Authority a year and a half ago in my role as Child Health Director. I am been asked to direct and uh, organize across our large agency health policy work going on for children and families. Um, and specifically to that end, asked to be the point person to help align our health system transformation with our early learning system transformation. And it's been such an honor to be part of the Early Learning Council and uh, JADA's uh, staff team uh, to move this work forward. So um, to that end, I'm going to pass it on. Whitney, do you want to share? Hi, I'm Whitney Groves, and I am the P20 Policy Advisor for the Oregon Education Investment Board. Um, and I came on board with, um, with the governor 
2011 and uh, was on his staff and then moved over when the OEIB <coughs> was formed and have been working um, in policy since then and I am I constantly try to get rid of the longitudinal database project, but somehow it's just like stick, sticks to me. So I am here representing and able to give you updates and hopefully um, learn from you all to things align and get me forward. Melissa, go ahead. Hi, I'm Melissa. I'm Jada's assistant. That's all we call things. I'm Lynn Saxton. I'm a member of the Early Learning Council, and I'm the executive director of Youth Villages for you. I'm Andrew Grover. I also work in Youth Villages. And I come from a, my training is mostly in, in the public health sector, and I have a particular focus on information management, especially with respect to healthcare. And I'm Jada Ruthann. I'm the assistant director. I'm Lisa Parker from Oregon Health Authority in the Office of Health IT background in social work and child welfare, data systems, and health IT systems. My name's Megan Irwin. I'm the Early Learning Systems Design Manager. Um, so what that means right now is that I'm really focused on the launch and implementation of the Early Learning Hubs. I'm very interested to be part of this group and think about how that work ties into the data system over time. I'm Carolyn Lawson. I'm the Chief Information Officer of the Oregon Health Authority and the Oregon Health Services. Um, I've got background in um, health and human services technology, education technology, education policy. Um, I've done a significant work in the human services side, social services, for several years at another state before I came here, and been here for two years. The scope of my responsibility is all the health and human services systems within the state. And you're still smiling. And I'm still smiling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Hi, I'm Dawn Woods, and I'm with the Early Learning Division Office of Child Care. It's still rolling off our tongue pretty well. It is. <laughs> um, and I'm actually the quality improvement manager, and so part of the race to the top team is a large chunk of my work, um, specifically around the quality rating improvement system. I'm Cy Smith, I'm the State Geospatial Information Officer, and I'm representing the Chief Information Office. So, whatever resources we can provide, I'll try to figure that out and maybe get the right people here and resources are right. I'm Mike Greenbar, I'm here um, standing in for Doug Costi, the Director of Enterprise Systems and OMC day to day SLBS, State All Wonder Chief Data System. Bobby Weber, Oregon State University, and a member of the Army Learning Council. And was a member of many of us on the um, former iteration of yep. the council's work on, on, data, on the data system. Great. And I will definitely be referencing that today. <coughs> um, I think we just have a few members of the public here, so I'd really love if you don't mind introducing yourself since it's such a small group. As a reminder, this is a public meeting, um, as we are basically a subcommittee of the Early Learning Council. Um, we do not have a, a phone line open right now. We'll likely do that in the future. Um, and we will not be taking public testimony as a, a subcommittee, but um, all 
testimony and feedback can certainly come via the Early Learning Council, and we're glad to have everybody here. All right, I'm going to um, take the lead on orienting us a little bit to the Early Childhood Data System and the task at hand. Um, as Bobby mentioned, um, this is really coming at the heels with a brief intermission <laughs> of the previous Early Childhood or uh, Early Learning Council Data System Work Group um, that was uh, um, put forward under the leadership of Dick Alexander. Um, here at the table, Bobby, Lynn, and Andrew and I participated in that uh, work group. I'm looking around, making sure I'm not missing anybody else. Um, as well as many other members which are listed um, in the work group report. So that work group um, convened about January through May of 2012 and submitted a report back to the legislature, or to the council, excuse me, which I will reference in here, but I wanted to call out the, uh, hey, I'm sorry. hey, no, that's perfect. <laughs> so um, I want to just spend some time calling that out. This is actually perfect. We just okay. finished, well, sort of. You missed the introductions, but we're going to come back to that. So do you want to, I think most people know you here. Do you mind if you want to introduce yourself real quick? I'd be happy to. Um, I'm Rob Saxon. I'm the Deputy Superintendent of Public Instruction for the state. Great. Would it be, I'll, we'll come back around, actually, um, after we do. So we're going to um, just move forward. So you should have, I was going to take us through the first couple of agenda items and then we're going to come back to reviewing our introductions okay. and talk about with that background how we see our role playing out in this group. So I think you'll get to hear a little bit more about everybody Thanks. at that point. So I believe there were um, slides that were passed around. Is that right? Yeah, I should <laughs> So this uh, is a very brief set of slides really to orient us back to the early childhood data system uh, work that has uh, gone on and to help us orient to our charge. Um, so I'm going to bring us back to Senate Bill 909, um, passed in 2011, which was the first legislation that alluded to or called out the uh, requirements around the data system work ahead. So as you see here, um, some of that work or a majority of that work was um, put forward for uh, duties of the Oregon Education Investment Board and I've just listed straight out of the legislation right here that they would uh, be providing an integrated statewide student database system that monitors expenditures and outcomes to determine the return on statewide education investments. Melissa, thank you for forwarding it. <laughs> um, and in, uh, in Senate Bill 909 also, um, was a reference to the role of the Early Learning Council, that they shall collect and evaluate data related to early childhood services to ensure that state goals are being achieved with the intention that early childhood data system systems would be aligned with the statewide longitudinal data systems. Um, in, in 2012, further information came forth out of House Bill 4165. Um, stating that the Early Learning Council shall develop recommendations for establishing a unified data collection system for public early childhood education and development programs and services throughout the state. Um, this is a little bit, in, in the meantime, um, the, a little bit out of order, but the Early Learning Council was required to uh, provide a report back to the legislature, or to the OEIB and the legislature regarding uh, Senate Bill 909. And I just pulled out the uh, brief paragraph that alluded to the role of the early childhood data system out of that Senate Bill 909. So uh, pretty consistent uh, with the le you know, what was called out in the legislation, um, but really focused on the need for a unique child identifier, um, the need for uh, outcome measures. Um, <coughs> And like I said, this is pretty consistent with the legislature, but was the vision of the Early Learning Council moving forward on what the role would be. So as I mentioned, the Early Learning, uh, the Early Learning Council Data System Work Group was convened last uh, January. The report was delivered to the Early Learning Council and approved, adopted at that time in May. And I have provided for you in your packets and in the email previously the longer work or the report, report from that work group. Um, I do want to highlight one thing in your packet. Um, there is a home visiting data system executive summary that um, got attached to that. That is actually not part of that report. It just got copied that way this morning. So I just wanted to let you know the last, if you're looking at the document in your packet, the last two pages are not formally part of the report. 
they are part of the materials for presentation today, and it's probably worth noting. So I, I certainly don't intend to go through the entire uh, report, um, but I'm going to just give you some highlights so that we're all starting off on the same note. Um, so the, this, the work group um, recommendations called for an integrated data system that brings together data across systems. So early learning, health, and human services were called out, and at multiple levels. So there was intentionality around data at the individual child, provider, and community level. Um, the three goals that were articulated by the work group were that our data system would improve coordination of services, guide resource allocation, and provide accountability for our new delivery system moving forward. And um, we recommended a phased uh, approach to developing this data system. These were the specifics that were suggested as next steps um, or as, as requirements, a secure system with transparent privacy, protection and security practices, the development of that unique identifier, as I mentioned from the uh, Senate Bill 909 report, a really strong necessity for a governance structure, inclusive of participating agencies, um, and a recommendation that the home visiting uh, data system be the first phase moving into this future data system. And I want to call out again, this is um, part of the report, but there were several reasons why the home visiting uh, data system work was incorporated as the first phase, and we'll be talking about this further this afternoon. But in the report, you will see there are a couple of reasons. It, um, there was a, a strong intentionality that this needs to be a quick win, that we need to have something in place and show that we're moving on this and not sit in meetings for several years and have nothing to show for our work. So that was really the charge of our wonderful leader at the time. And the, the home visiting data system um, comes from, ha, has had grant funding, has grant funding to, um, to start that work, and so it was looked to as an opportunity to leverage that work into the broader goals that we had. Um, it also was really clear that the providers and um, those served f by home visiting were real consistent with um, those families and providers that are going to be part of our home early learning system. And so it was felt to be very complementary um, group to start with moving forward. The next, I'm going to pause when I'm done with this and look to my colleagues who were on this a work group together, but I just want to articulate the next steps that were recommended in this report. Um, to secure a qualified proje uh, project team, to appoint a data system steering committee, here we have it, um, to develop a list of agency divisions and partners participating in the system and identify key leads, um, to inventory existing data systems, and to uh, create and approve a formal governance plan. So I want to just talk about, or I just want to open it up to Bobby, uh, Lynn, and Andrew if you wanted to give any additional um, thoughts to that work that we did and spent many hours together. Um, if you have any clarifications or additions to what I've said um, to illustrate the work and the vision that came from that group. I think the only thing that I would bring is I, first of all, tremendous respect for Dick Alexander who at a moment in his life when his health was declining really hunkered down with all of us and we had some really intense discussions. There's no doubt that there are many stakeholders in the system that uh, their own with objectives for the system and we're trying to balance the relationship between um, results data for kids and families which we need to be held accountable to in terms of the uh, quick win that Dana acknowledged is key to this initiative success um, and also having high integrity research that is in, in data for research. But we have to accomplish both of those. One is not preeminent, one doesn't dominate. And at the end of the day, if the um, Megan's good work on the hub, I don't know what we call it, hub launch, hub creation, is very dependent on this piece getting up and running quickly. Um, because the stakeholders to the process, the investors in the process, have one of the key uh, elements of the whole effort is being able to develop client level outcomes and con connect client level data right from the get go. The only thing that I would add is really just to underscore a couple of the points that, that you made. And one is that um, 
from, from my chair anyway, making the system like this work will require buy-in at the executive level of the agencies that are affected by this. Um, and and to, to go with that, I mean, because to have that, the will that it will happen and it will work is going to be fundamental. Um, and, and second to that is a, a decision-making process that is effective and, and uh, relatively timely because these things get real complicated real fast. And if we don't have an ability to make decisions in an informed way and in a timely way, we'll be here five years from now talking about the same thing. Uh, the only thing, it's just a minor, the part of what I remember being very compelling about starting the home visiting was, it's, the, as you said, the targeted children, uh, them already, but we're getting them at the beginning with home visiting, and so um, the, it was pretty compelling once it was presented to us, it was like, okay, here's a way to start with a four piece that's exactly who we want, and we're getting them at birth or close to birth. And so that's, I don't know, I mean, that's just, it stuck in my mind um, as a really important piece of the recommendation mm -hmm. was that they're the targeted group, we have the money, from the grant <laughs> to right. get going. We had the, you know, so many pieces in place and we got them as babies. I want to acknowledge there was some technical work that was going on um, during and I think after our work group met. And Mike, if you don't mind me calling you out, I know that you participated in that. Did you want to add anything from your perspective last, I think it was mostly last summer, some of that work going on? Yes, actually, we spent a good number of months you know, with, with Kathleen's team, um, by and large, and, and we did a lot of technical work, and some of the most important work we did was around um, discussion about data standards, and we came to agreement pretty quickly on some data standards issues uh, so that the system would have greater usefulness um, to all stakeholders. We, we, all, we all look at um, clients or individuals slightly differently and define different attributes them, and we need to understand, we need to come to about what the means, and so that was, but I don't know, Kathleen, I think you summed it up well. Okay. I think the, the key point here is that we really shared a vision, and mm -hmm. I think we came to some foundational understanding that we thought we should have seen, mm -hmm. so the reason to change it. <coughs> so, um, I'm noting my slide that says interval history, which I think is a bit of a joke, given all of what has happened over the last year in the legislature, in the work that's been done. These slides were, of course, meant to be focused on uh, the, the work of the data system work group and other work that has gone. So um, I want to acknowledge that, um, as we've heard reference, and we'll talk about later again, the home visiting data system work is funded through a federal grant, the Maternal Infant and Early Childhood Home Visiting grant and so they have continued to move forward on the work required by their grant um, structure and timelines and so um, part of today is trying to reconnect on some of that work that's been going on and all the work that's happened on the early learning council and legislation moving forward and kind of see where we are and where to move forward um, I also want to really recognize and kind of the next part of this conversation, I think, is to really place our early childhood data system work in the, the broader data system work happening in, this, in the state, and, and the role of the Oregon Education Investment Board, the role of the SLDS. Um, and so to that end, um, kind of as an interval update, I asked Whitney to provide a few words about what attention was given to data system um, around education in this session. So do you want to pick, pass yeah. out? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, as Dana noted, in Senate Bill 909, one of the main deliverables of the OEIB is around the statewide longitudinal data system. Um, and there is, uh, basically, there are many different efforts which people view as the statewide longitudinal data system. Mm -hmm. It has come to, to mean a lot of things to a lot of different people and it starts to encompass sort of everything that there is to know about data and children in the state of Oregon. 
Um, and so, as usually happens with the legislature, um, Rob and his team did a wonderful job of kind of guiding the legislature, reining them in, kind of redirecting their thinking when it got sort of a little bit off track, um, and really tried to make the point about what, what we're talking about when we're talking about a statewide longitudinal data, data system. Um, in the beginning of, prior to the session starting, um, when the governor had convened his education funding team, um, which I staffed with Ben Cannon, we had looked at the issues of you know, are we really ready to, to make a big ask of the legislature? What are we asking for exactly? Um, and at that point, it was determined that a wiser course of action would be to ask the legislature for funding to do a business case that really fleshes out these these um, questions about what is the vision for the data system? Who are the users? What do they want? Is this one system, is this really just an interface of multiple systems? Um, how do we really accomplish this in a, in a um, you know, efficient, expedient, and uh, responsible manner? And, um, and then proceed to also ask the legislature if we could mm -hmm. reserve some bonding cap capacity to be able to access that when the, when the time is right. Um, and so what you have here really, I just pulled from um, the Oregon Department of Education's the legislation passing their budget included um, information about the package that will fund the data um, the business case, the data system business case, and then a budget note which directs the Oregon Department of Ed to work closely um, with the Department of Administrative Services and others and kind of outlines uh, the things that the legislature will want to know when we present this business case back to them um, in the next session. And at that point, the ask will be for them to release the $10 million in reserve bonding capacity to be able to get going on the actual um, you know, building construction. That makes it sound like a building, but you know what I mean. But the development of the statewide launch data system. Next steps. So, do you have stuff to add? Uh, I think you have it down. Uh, so that's what we, that's as far as we got this session, but it's definitely So Mike is going to give us an overview of the statewide luncheon data system. I just wanted to pause if there are any questions about what I shared as well as the previous data systems doing committee members or what Whitney just shared. Any questions or clarification? So $700,000 for the planning, the business planning. So, they have it lumped together here, 700000 for the business plan and equipment replacement. And I think in our detailed budget, it's actually 200000 for the business case development and then 500000 for the maintenance of some of the, um, you could say. Server infrastructure. Yeah, yeah, the <laughs> server infrastructure of the existing, of the existing. pieces. Sure. Okay. Okay, and then the $10 million is... Is that for the actual build of the longitudinal system, or is that for uh, development of next steps to plan the build, or what is that? The two hundred thousand is for the, the the planning, the steps, and the, and the development of the business case, and the ten million is for actually you know, hiring folks to come and, and complete the work of the longitudinal database. No, I would just say, do um, the next steps or the yes. next, it, it oh, 10 million yes. will completed. No, right, right. No, so, okay, right. good. Sorry. Because I was beginning to have part failure. Yes, right. yes. No. yes. No. Yeah. Yeah. This, okay. bi this biennium is worth of right. this This work. round. Yeah. We should, I think that um, we've had a project on where the funds where we have like 9 million. Uh, 10 and a half. Okay, 10 and a half. 10 and a half million um, on Project Alder, and I think about sort of what that has done, and you probably can talk about that better than I can. What we've been able to accomplish with that ten and a half million dollars, and then you see this ten million. You know that there's work that can be completed that will help these systems to um, communicate with one another in ways that move the data but don't um, compromise uh, personal information and so forth, and and allow us to track system outcomes um, from sort of one step to the next in a, in a student's career, or educational career or life. Um, but it still, it doesn't complete the build. There's, it would take much, much more than that to do that. Yeah. Especially with the need to in integrate different parts of the system beyond just the kind of educational piece. 
Thank so you. My, I'm, I'm that so no. I'm here. Well, and so from that, just looking at the, the scope of some of our health and human services systems, which touch yeah. many of the same clients and looking at the 10 million and thinking, hmm, interesting, if, if that was all that there was, but no, I think that would be okay. so, yeah. so just a quick question, two questions. One is what, so now I'm just dying of curiosity, what, it, what is the cost of the bill? What is, what is the range that you would project for the cost of the bill? Um, I can give some examples. Um, the the cost of the child welfare system was upwards of sixty million. The cost of the insurance exchange that's um, orchids was sixty million. Yeah. Uh, the cost of the insurance exchange um, that grant level was fifty eight million. The DHS modernization um, project, which is the SNAP right now and will be TANF and some of the other um, pieces, is also in that same kind of a range. Um, one of the, the pieces that we've, um, that we're hoping will get clarified and really nailed down in the, the business case is depending on whether or not we are talking about a student level, user level mm -hmm. uh, uh, interface is something very different than it, it, mm -hmm. currently our districts and other providers are really putting the bill for a lot of that level of the data system when we're talking about something a little bit different. I might not the best person to describe but you know what I mean. And yeah. so and so the, the cost can vary, um, although we also got a sixty million dollar uh, quote presented to us last year around if we were to do all the things that we envisioned it would be sixty million. Um, but I think there are various stages and steps to come about that are not really talking about one student information system for all school districts and universities. Community colleges are only talking about the rate for us to make sure that they are So my second question was, is there a state with a longitude to with a similar system in place? <laughs> so if, if I can, um, and this my information is two years old, just to give some perspective, um, working in the state of California, we were looking for a system that was best of breed and the place we were looking to lift from was Oregon. The systems across the country all have significant issues and the thinking within the state of Oregon is actually more mature than what you find in other states. That was from two years ago. So other, thanks. other states have prioritized different parts of statewide longitudinal data systems. So here are states with statewide student information systems, um, single systems, and also just federated systems. But there's nobody who really has a comprehensive system at this time. Thank you. There are states that have done parts of it better than we have, for sure. Probably like a longitudinal data system all the way through there, way through time. So there are systems that can be replicated, but um, putting it all together, that's, um, there are some states that do some of that, but I don't think there's anybody who has it all. Do you want to go ahead, Mike, and yes. walk us through the statewide longitude data system? Sure. I think that's a good segue for us. Please feel free to jump in with questions or comments, or um, if you need clarification, we use a slightly different app, and that's you. Um, one of the final slides is a list of abbreviations, so we can care to flip back over and try and get to it again. So, um, could you rather read it? I'm happy to, but if you. Um, yeah. 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 Project Alder is the name of our most recent statewide longitudinal data system grant. And uh, Oregon has had a number of them, Linux Prize in history. My goal is to demystify this diagram. It's an overview of, of our system, simplified overview of our systems, and I'll call out what is currently the longitudinal data systems, what is not, and why uh, there's a difference. So in this first ellipsis, that's not the statewide longitudinal data system. That's the system of record. That's where school districts provide us with data for various data collections. In this archaic model, 
where for a roughly three week period we collect certain types of information about students or staff or the schools and the data are validated and saved for reporting later. So we're not constantly collecting information. We have very little transparency into what goes on day to day out in schools through this system of record, the official data system. And we've got student, staff, and institution collections on the left, career and technical education. Uh, the middle data store there is all assessment data, and the right-hand data store is external sources like food stamp, Medicaid, teacher license <coughs> data. Every night, we move the data and transform it into our longitudinal data systems. And what we do is we change the format of the record so we can see the truth at the end of each day for each record. So if a school district edits one field about attendance for a student, maybe, maybe changes the race ethnicity, we will see that one change so we'll know the truth of yesterday and we'll know the truth of the end of today. If, if someone edits a record multiple times during the day, we don't preserve that. We only see the truth at the end of the day for each of our systems. And so all the, the data travels vertically here, so all of our student, staff, and institution information goes into operational data stores. Those are the longitudinal formats that allow us to see change over time. Um, the assessment information goes into that student-centered operational data store. And then we also pull in data from other sources like the National Student Clearinghouse that tells us about higher ed enrollment and degree attainment events and um, external assessments from vendors. Um, so the, the PSAT and SAT um, tests are, are representative of that. And then we also have this other data store called the Regional Education Data Store. And this is part of a more modern system that's under development that's in that blue ellipsis. So districts voluntary, voluntarily affiliate with a region and they, they push their data to that region and nightly we get information from those regions. So a much more, much greater transparency into what's going on day to day. There's some disadvantages. The data is not always validated. Districts can't be sure that their data is perfectly clean in all areas at every moment. But that's essentially the vision for the future. And, and um, Robin um, uh, at the back table here from CTA North and Lyman ESD has been instrumental in this process from the get-go. And uh, while Amity SD, CTA North serves many, many districts around the state, including those rural districts who don't have the capacity to develop this type of infrastructure for themselves. Up in this top ellipsis, the green one, is really the new piece for, for Project Alder. This is where we, we start to go cross-agency and get a broader perspective on these children, these students, these adults. So <clears throat> there are agencies represented along the top, teacher standards and practices, community colleges and workforce development, the Oregon Employment Department, and Oregon University System. And they all will contribute data to a shared operational data store. What information will they contribute? Whatever information the other partner agencies deem important for the program evaluations, for the reports um, to understand how to better improve the system. There's also a little dotted line going up there uh, that says OSTX. We have an electronic student record exchange application. When students move between districts or when they apply to Oregon University System schools, their transcripts can go up that way and be available um, to partners. So really, that cross-sector P20W data warehouse and, and, and operational data store is the new piece of our longitudinal data systems. P stands for pre-K, uh, 20, 20 slash W is, is all the way to workforce. Um, even that conception is, is broadening out. So here's the evolution. Why is the Department of Ed kind of the hub for SLDS because the federal government started giving out funds in fiscal year 06 and they were focused on grade 1 to grade 12, period. In fiscal year 07, they broadened that piece slightly, K-12. In fiscal year 09, they said K-16. 
And in Alder's funding year, fiscal year 10, they said this is really a P20 workforce effort. And this was a real first focus on early childhood. Um, Oregon competed for, we did not compete in fiscal year 06, we, we did in all the other competitions, we received SLDS grants in all those other years, the 07, 09, and, and fiscal year 10, um, and, and then worked with partners to define what longitudinal data, data system functionality uh, was desired. So this fiscal year 010 grant is Project Alder, and sometimes people say Alder synonymously with uh, when they mean SLDS and vice versa. They're not quite synonymous, but that's, that's acceptable. So here's one lens for the, a purpose of the SLDS. Modernize our existing data exchanges with these partners. We already exchange data with each other. We've got separate agreements. We don't want to do that anymore. We want to put data in an appropriate container with appropriate safeguards and generate all of our reports and support program improvement, program evaluation um, through that shared source. So research, evaluation, policy support, and calling out excluded purposes. This isn't a data store for every purpose. You build the data store with, with particular purposes in mind and, and, and set up the functioning to support those purposes. What are the policy questions? Right now, the statement is that policy questions really are those defined in our various achievement compacts. If bodies like this want to, to see other policy questions addressed, we'd like to hear about them so that we can talk about whether we need additional data, whether we need additional rules, or how to, how to support those policy decisions. So it's not one system. The system of record we have is for collection, that's that transaction system. We've changed so that we report off our, our longitudinal data systems. It is the official reporting data source, these operational data stores. So that, that modern system that is showed on the side uh, with the regions is referred to as kids in red sometimes. Our operational data stores, which we looked at, and we'll see again, student assessment. Why? Here's why. In the past, if you wanted to know something really simple about a, a K-12 student, like what kind of math scores did this kid get? You'd have to go to database tables named like the ones on the left there, math for the 04, 05 years, and you wouldn't know whether there's a score until you look in the table. And you gotta do this over and over. Well, guess what? There are a bunch of subjects, a bunch of grades, a bunch of years. You have to look many, many places, 30, 40, 50 places, just to see the assessment data for a kid. Not very simple, not very helpful. So we got rid of that, and we have that student-centered operational uh, data store. I can look in that event table and see every assessment a kid ever took, whether it was valid or not, whether it was the kid's best score or not. I can look in one place and see it all, I can see all the English language learner assessments, I can see all of the Oaks statewide assessments, I, I can look in one place and get a really coherent view of student performance. So that's why we're, we're using these operational data stores as the official um, data source. So remember it's just the truth at the end of each day and not all changes. And we can ask the question, what was the truth as of, as of a given date? Hey, did this kid take a math test? Yes. He took math oaks test this year but didn't meet the, the desired score but I can see that the student tried um, so that's just a summation of the data sources we've got a number of agencies that would like to join project all of that weren't involved in the original proposal so um, the Oregon Student um, Assistance Commission OSAC would like to join this is the, the um, higher ed financial aid uh, agency. So any student who applies for federal financial aid um, works with OSAC and um, they would like to join the project Alder so that we can uh, start to build an appropriate picture of return on investment, see where, which school students apply to, which 
students elected to receive financial aid at those institutions and how successful they were um, throughout their career. So back to the big mystical diagram. That's a current overview, calling out the different pieces. This isn't just a, a conceptual diagram of the kids approach the regional warehouses. They're all named there. Beaverton, Hillsborough, and Eugene, and Portland were the original um, regions. Uh, Lambert and Limbit and Lincoln have joined in, and they all feed data to this grid system. I think. Mm -hmm. We hope that we'll get the support to either make this a system of record or enhance it so that we have um, data available daily for uh, to answer questions that, that uh, need to be answered more than, say, once a year in annual reports. So what's the data delta? What do we have in our SLDS that we don't have in other ways? We've got immunization data, really important for schools to serve students. We've got guardian data. That's not available on our system of record. No immunization information is in our system of record. We have marks data, so what grades students earn. The schedule data, if districts schedule, elect to schedule, for an entire year, we'll see what courses the kid is is intending to take. And then when we when they earn a mark, we can see if they actually finished a course and how well they did. Um, if they didn't succeed, what course did they enroll in next and what was their trajectory after that. We've got formative assessment data. That's something we don't have in our, our system of record yet. Formative assessments obviously are important to early childhood. Um, and so we want to learn how to handle all those various types of performance assessments appropriately. We have the higher ed outcome data from National Student Clearinghouse, all higher ed enrollments and degree attainments, um, and then Oregon University system data. Um, what's the functional delta? The, the functional delta is really that we get this daily submission. Um, we've got the record transfer support, both horizontal between districts and vertically going to OUS. Next year, that that vertical transfer would be built out um, to a national brokerage. So when an Oregon student applies to five school institutions higher ed across the, the nation, we'll see which five they apply to. We'll see which ones accepted the student and which one the student chose to attend. Um, and when, how much latency did they enroll the first term that they were accepted, or did they delay that? So we'll have a much better view of how students move through the system and, and quicker access to some of the data. What's coming? More achievement compact data. Um, next gen state report card, uh, a bunch of vendor data of different sorts, including early childhood formative assessment data, teaching strategies, gold as they um, poured in pre K, um, universally adopted assessment, kindergarten readiness assessment data, uh, and we'll have um, our first good dimensionally modeled data source. Why does that matter? Those dimensionally modeled data sources are the ones that let an end user choose what they want to see and it presents the information on the fly. Until we get to this dimensional modeling, that type of um, functionality is very difficult to achieve. And um, every time we negotiate a new contract with a vendor, um, <coughs> we're pushing those vendors to allow us to redistribute the information. School districts have more information than, than ODE but we have no knowledge of the accuracy of the information. If we can get all of the information from a vendor and permission to redistribute it, then we've got one route for an authoritative data source um, to support um, schools, and that information can travel with the kit when they move between districts. And support for Common Core State Standards and support for the Common Education Data Standards were, were strongly supporting the use of the common education data standards so that when we're asked to share data appropriately, um, we've got a predefined way of defining data. So SLDS really stands for data um, uh, Another piece that's, that's unusual that is not going to be exposed anytime soon is this identity resolution layer. When we join data from different systems, we need to know how to link the records. Our ODE systems require legal first name and last name. That's not true of most of our other partners. 
we don't have a common identifier to join the records, so we have to go through this probabilistic matching. It's pretty complex, and we want to know that we, we've got it right. So um, we're developing this identity resolution layer that will allow us to link records with different characteristics, with different bits of data in them, and, and speak with confidence about the quality of the linked data. So each agency will contribute their own identifiers, and then the whole other system will make up its own internal ID, and those records are linked to and through um, the Alder ID. At this time, no data is, is um, permitted to come out of Alder until all agencies agree that the data is accurate for the defined purposes. The partner agencies have said nothing comes out. Um, when we feel like it's accurate, we'll, we'll start to pull data out. So here's some misconceptions about the SLBS. I've heard people say, well, it's all the identified data. That's not true. We don't want that to be true. It needs to remain identified. Why? The SLBS does not have treatment data. We've got, by and large, outcome data. So we can find out in the, in the K-12 world which students did better. We have no information about what treatments they got, how much reading instruction, which programs they participated in. So we don't know why. We need to preserve the identified data so that those of you who have that information and want to study it are able to understand how this group of students graduated at a much higher rate than their peers or um, did so well um, in Oaks assessment compared to their peers. So no treatment data in the SLBS. The data remains identified, and, um, and uh, privacy is protected through this identity resolution and management plan. That's it. Questions or comments? Clarification? So I have questions, but so I'm going to reveal my ignorance in the group setting. The um. So when, when you say that the, the kids are in there, the information's at the kid level, you, does that mean that as a kid moves through various school districts, for example, you can track currently those kids moving through? Yes. And you have information at this point, a fair amount of information that would allow, for example, if we are able to build the, the connector for the zero to five group through the home visiting, but as long as we design it accurately, it can go together with the other stuff. Yes. And so that that is an important thing for us to remember as we're doing this, that that there's a lot of in infrastructure in place and we have to be thinking about connecting to it. Yes. And to, and about, to make this as valuable as it appears to be it, to leverage what you've already created. I, I would agree. Um, and, and there's been discussion about um, identifiers so that we can issue them early in early childhood and help track the child. We need a, a lot more information about that process if, if that's to happen. And, yeah. Yeah, that's because yeah. that is a re really important element at the hub level is to be able to not just get research data, but to be able to say we made these investments yes. in this population and it connected to K through 20 success. But you think there's a way to do that? There, there is a way to do that. There, there are several ways to do that. Um, mm -hmm. We just need to hear requirements from the law and, and policies that we want to implement and then talk to stakeholders because Almost, almost everything we hear about the requirements and policies, we need to engage stakeholders and talk to their people as well about the business rules. Do we identify um, each child at birth with a unique ID that's kept by anybody? So, it, <laughs> if a child is um, enrolled in Medicaid, there is a unique Medicaid identifier that's attributed at birth. As an example, there are many different systems out there. I presume that Human Services has the same um, example, but they're all different. But there's not a universal. So there's, the family is not participating in any services of 
any kind, they have a baby in a hospital, they have a doctor, do they, do, does that family and that child does not get a unique identifier that the health authority controls? Um, we have unique identifiers for the people who work within uh, our services. For the people who are outside of our services, we don't create those. So we don't, for example, give an ID to a hospital when a baby is born. But there are ways to create IDs based upon um, child's birthday, birthday to parents, a combination of things. And there's some algorithms that can be used. So it's not really that you need to go to a registry to get the ID. Um, to his point, we need to come up with what the standards are and the agreements are about how we're going to identify. And if we do that, what that will allow then is for systems that we already have in place to um, make logical connections. They may not be 100% perfect, but they're going to be 99.99. Um, so we can track, for example, the child welfare kids uh, against um, the education data if we can link that identifier together. So there's some work on that. I was very excited too to hear you talk about uh, agreement on standards. Mm -hmm. um, that I think would be something that would be really helpful for your shop and my shop to get together Absolutely. on so that we start having a consistent way of identifying people inside of our data systems. To keep that. But it's the, the data behind the data that's most important. So that we all have the same understanding of what each field means. So again, just to, Michael. So if I understand it right, a big part of Alder is um, K twelve has a certain identifier. Higher yes. has a different one. Yes. And the idea is that we're going to be able to transfer information and sort of match up those identifiers without sharing identifiers. Is that correct? That is correct. Yeah. I mean, that's sort of the simple. Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully, the simple way. To Say it, you know, I understand it. And what we need to be able to do is mm -hmm. that similar kind of um, opportunity between different systems. But I think what what I'm seeing here is um, a lot of the issues related to that have been figured out between the other systems, and it is a place to start building them. So um, you know, the lift is not well, not easy. It's easier. And with the identity resolution layer, we think the next step is kind of a, a go fish model. If somebody's doing research on employment outcomes, they might pass to someone affiliated with the project a list of their identifiers and say, do you have workforce outcomes for these individuals? And we could reply, yes, we, we, we know all of those individuals, and we've got workforce outcomes for 43% of them. You're not authorized to get them now, but but at least you know if you want to go fishing, <laughs> you're going to get 43% of your fish. So. Is there a so lots of great expertise around the table, tremendous talent here. One of the challenges we have as we get ready to launch an RFP to the hubs is to is to say here's here's kind of the simple easy version of what of how you need to begin thinking of framing up your data set. Is there is there something that we could articulate based on this and the connection to the healthcare system to say, whatever else you do, don't forget to do these five things, just to make sure yes. that, that we're not reinventing the wheel or causing tremendous frustration or mm -hmm. expecting levels of expertise that don't exist in the early childhood system because of the way it's going to be. Mm -hmm. and, and I would say that if the standards, if the standards are built and agreed upon, that needs to be um, and then, and I haven't seen those, and so I don't know how to connect back to the health and human services side. But it, if standards are developed, it makes it a lot easier then to connect back. So there, there's opportunities. Related to that, I think we, we need some um, policy decisions to support reporting, for example. So if you want to know how um, a low income population uh, performs, Early childhood it has a definition of low income or poverty that's different from K 12s, that's mm -hmm. different from community politics, it's different from higher ed, it's different from workforce. And so that's you just different. need an understanding about 
it, it's different from SNAP, it's different yeah, from absolutely. Medicaid, right. it's different yeah. from child welfare. Yeah. So um, that being able to develop, and it might take legislation, a common language that we're going to define um, these things this way for this purpose. Um, and then find the, the areas that are important to report upon or connect into, and I'm thinking of the human services arena. Mm -hmm. And how, how do we make those adjustments so that we're talking about the same thing? Because many of our programs are driven by uh, federal determination of poverty level. Some of our programs, though, we have discretion. And to be able to identify those areas of discretion and then come to an agreement on what that's going to look like, of course, that throws funding models and all kinds of stuff. Um, but, um, or to be able to create uh, ranges or some other right. mechanism so, right, that so that it plugs into whatever right. those mm -hmm. criteria are depending on the agency. Right, right. So this is a tremendous start, I think, to our committee's conversation. I've marked down a lot of these topics as I think are going to be high priority and we'll continue on them. I just wanted, Rob, do you have anything to add to this conversation before I move this briefly on? I, no, I just, uh, first of all, I want to apologize for being the latest back. Oh yeah, I'll co-chair and show up later, but uh, so especially today, I apologize for that. And then, um, I probably don't have, anything else I say, to say would be like really simplistic probably, but I'll, I'll maybe say it anyway. So I um, try to draw a parallel to things that I don't, when I don't understand something really well, I try to draw a parallel to it so that I have some context by which I can, you know, hang my, hang my concept off of. And so for me, the concept on this is a lot like when I'm driving down the street in my really fast-growing um, community, and all of a sudden there's a road that doesn't go anywhere, or it doesn't make sense why that, you know, or you're riding along on your bike and the um, bike lane disappears, and there's a really pinch point there, and it scares you to death for the next 200 yards, and you ride like a madman until you get to the next place where there's a, actually is a bike lane. I don't know if I've ever done that before, but I do that once in a while. Or I think about what would it look like if we just laid this beautiful, beautiful, beautiful street down in the middle of nowhere and put houses around it and didn't connect it to anything. Mm -hmm. And really and truly, the only way that you ever start to, to do this is to say that's not going to be acceptable. And anything that you build has to be planned. There's got to be a planning process around it. We have to think about how all of it interconnects. And it can't just be about the streets. It has to be about all parts of the system. So. When we put the streets in, we also have to make sure that the sewer line hooks up appropriately so that the manholes run down the center of the street. Um, and that any time that anybody's going to build along the street from now on, you have to put the power lines underground. We're not going to have above ground power lines anymore. And that's just a requirement and an expense for building on the street. And so we do those things really well when we talk about sort of the city plan, well, relatively well, when we talk about the city planning part of it. But everybody understands what the rules are. I'm going to have some money, I'm going to build this street, and in order to do it, I have to have a street that lines up with the sewer line, that has a bike lane, that has a sidewalk that coordinates with the other sidewalks, and the power lines are going underground. And that's the expense of building this section of street. That's the conversation that we need to have about these data mm -hmm. projects, that from this point forward, there's nothing that's going to be built that cannot coordinate with the entire system, and these are the financial requirements to build your section of the street and to come along with all of this and it has to lead to somewhere. It lets people travel up and down in a way that makes sense and it lets us um, control the information in an appropriate way so that it works to achieve what it is that we're attempting to achieve. So that's my little, little construct for that and I do think it is. We've got to have the rules in place so that we understand how to put that all together. So um, whether that helps people or not, you know, it helps my simple simple mind. And I think that if we're going to spend money, we have to spend it so that that happens on each component from this point forward. Okay. That's a great, a great place to launch us from. I think what I wanted to articulate, not nearly so eloquent, is to call out. I think maybe what, Lynn, you were feeling is that there's a pretty diverse group of people here with a lot of, I think, a really great set of expertise and, and um, lens to come to this conversation. So we have some pretty significant te technology expertise. Clearly, I am not that person. <laughs> uh, policy, programmatic expertise. And so I'm really excited that we're all coming together to kind of build what you're talking about. What I do want to also articulate and maybe place us is really acknowledgement of a large amount of work that has both happened before us and that we're building off of. I think that you articulated that well. 
a large amount that's going to come out of the legislative decision this session um, to be moved forward by the OEIB. Um, and where the role is for our early learning data systems committee is I think we're going to be navigating that a little bit. But I think one of the roles that we're going to start to identify ourselves and was asked of us by Pam Curtis was what are the unique pieces of the early learning system? What are the, the needs um, of this new transformational process we're going for and all the partners at the table that might look slightly different or have different requirements than what the full SLDS and picture was you know, moving forward? And what is it that we want to make sure we articulate and contribute to that broader conversation? Does that feel right to everybody? So with that, I'm going to, and also um, just so we're all kind of on the same page again, I want to, we've, I want to go back around and I want to hear everybody maybe just mention again where you come from so that we're all now listening and settled into this conversation a little bit and maybe offer up a little bit of your thoughts about where you see your role in this conversation um, and what questions you still have that we need to basically come back to make sure we answer. Does that sound okay? So. Um, I, you know, introduced myself, I think, um, where I see myself not as a technology person. Um, I definitely have a level of clinical expertise at the very interface with patients, clients, if you will, members. Um, so I bring that to the table as well as a programmatic and some policy um, vision of how there's, in the early learning system, it's not education, it's not human services, it's not health, it is this diverse set of players that all share a vision towards really similar and overlapping outcomes. Um, and so that's the vision I bring to the conversation and really look forward to bringing that angle forward in our conversation. And I have lots of questions, but yeah. I think you will help me articulate those. Uh, Whitney Grubbs, OEIB Policy. Um, this was very, so far, it has been really incredibly helpful to me. Um, so thank you to everyone for their background and presentations and explanations and analogies, and they're all really helping me think about this. Um, and I see my role really as um, helping to keep the, uh, as, as Mike was talking, he was talking about really having made the decision to build the, uh, the P20 system around the achievement compact indicators, which really are just our highest level um, sort of uh, leverage points along a child's life from at this point assessment from you know K through 20 um, but really so I see my role as that kind of keeper of the high level outcomes keeper keeper of the vision and making sure that as a state and an investment board that the information that comes from this data system is going to be able to tell us which interventions are leading to successful outcomes where we need to do do more where um, are our most um, impactful and efficient and um, two perspectives. One is I see myself as a 30-year investor in better outcomes for kids and families in Oregon. And when I say investment, I mean financial investor, time investor, and, and, and personal uh, volunteerism investor. So um, going across social service systems, school systems, healthcare systems in that 30 years. The experience of that that I have and that we, you know, that we use in our work every day is that if you measure something on a meaningful level, you can change what you're doing to produce the result that you want. And I'm firmly committed to that modality, particularly in light of a 170-day school year, a 45% dropout rate, a 42 to pop a 42% hunger rate, and what we suspect in the early learning data is about 108 to 145,000 children every year who, if they do not get what they need, will be functionally uh, illiterate in the world we live in, meaning that all aspects of the state will fail, not the least of which is our economy. So I have kind of those two frames that I bring to this. Uh, well, well, thanks. Uh, as I said earlier, um, my training is principally in the public health uh, domain, uh, particularly around information management and healthcare. 
their assistance from the provider perspective more than from the public perspective. But um, I, I'm carrying the same kind of vision as has been discussed here, and I'm, I'm excited about the prospect of trying to use a system, develop and use a system like this to improve our public health. My, my particular skills, I think, that I can help with are around process engineering. They, they have a, a strong capacity for process engineering uh, and, and project management. They have a pretty good sense of how high-level ideas translate to, okay, how are we going to get that done? Uh, so those are going to be the areas that, that I'll probably be commenting on. Because I have enough technical training and experience to, to be dangerous and, and annoy people like Michael. Um, with, with meddling questions in, to get things nailed down. So. And you're a parent. Yeah, and, I, and my kid's system is probably, my kid's information is probably in all of them. So. Mm -hmm. I'm Lisa Parker. I'm from the Northern Health Authority Office of Health IT. But my background is in social work and direct social work, being a child welfare worker, working in probation youth knowing what it means to navigate all the different systems, jurisdictions, getting records, especially with adolescents. So I know the complications and the time I spent as a worker to try to get information. And then background in working on ORCIDs in the full development of it, and then now uh, working in policy and program implementation for health IT, health information exchange, and watching the national landscape, watching the data standards, the transport mechanism, all of those things evolve, and seeing um, from that social worker perspective the bigger picture of how overlaying different information pieces that really bring you to understand uh, the different elements of interventions that are happening to an individual person as a whole, and not just in the educational system or in the healthcare system. And I really, I have that lens and can kind of see, oversee, but also understand the complexity of data systems connecting with just a little bit of technical understanding. So I'm Megan Irwin for the Learning Division. And um, as I said, I'm tasked with um, helping lead the launch and implementation of Early Learning Hubs, which is our method for coordinating early learning systems and services at the local level. And so um, I think one of the reasons I'm on this committee is so that as we're figuring out what we want to collect initially um, for the hubs. We're not creating something that's completely random and disconnected from a much bigger conversation that's happening right now. Um, and I think uh, Dana and Lynn both said it so well, a lot of the information that we need to understand about how services are being coordinated or not and how they're making an impact for children and families or not. Um, a lot of that data lies across three state agencies, DHS, ODE in terms of kindergarten readiness and third grade reading, um, and at the health authority. And so we're really trying to navigate, even just as we're starting to baseline the information for the outcomes that we want to ask hubs for, we're navigating across multiple state agencies. And I think being part of this group will help us understand how we set that up better and how we set it up in the simplest possible way from the state to hub and hub to service provider level so that it can fold into this bigger system that's getting developed. Um, because we can't wait for the bigger data system to exist before we start the hub work. Um, so I want to make sure that to the extent possible it's aligned and that we're not laying sidewalk in the random field somewhere <laughs> where nobody's going to come live. And I have a nonprofit and organizational development background, so similarly don't have a lot of the technical expertise. I know what I want to know. I don't know how to always say it in techie language, so I really appreciate the helpful analogy um, and the patience of folks around the table as I ask for things in a way that might not actually make sense from a data perspective, but I just know what we want to understand about families and kids. Um, Carolyn Lawson, I'm the Chief Information Officer of the Oregon Health Authority and the Chief Information Officer of the Oregon my office is a shared services between both of those um, organizations. We share data systems together. We share the support of those data systems together. Um, we have an extraordinary opportunity right now. There's on the human services side, there's a huge modernization effort going on. Um, 
to uh, modernize the way that we think about, not just modernize the IT systems as they stand, but modernize the way we think about service delivery. So we're talking about things like unified case management, which will then give a long longitudinal view of the people we serve across all of our programs throughout their lives, rather than in the 137 different systems that I have right now, 44 of which are case management systems that um, the agency is currently using. Um, the health authority is going through some very unique changes as we're moving toward the coordinated care organization model. We're actually at the very beginnings of that, and, and there's a broad horizon in front of us. And many of our systems will begin to adapt and change. So it's a really, really good time to work together uh, to either uh, adopt similar standards or figure out how we're going to translate to those standards and what that means to um, create an opportunity for data sharing on a large scale without having to rebuild uh, this big, massive data system and kind of do the big do-over, but what do we have and how are we going to connect together going forward to, um, I have a vision for uh, use agreements, which I know we're going to have to do some negotiating with the feds around how do we share data across the state of Oregon in a different kind of a way. And, and I don't know if, it, if it's legislated or creating some kind of special consortium. I don't know what that looks like, but I would love to get to a place where um, HIPAA and FERPA are not the barriers and the reason why we fight, but that they're, um, we have learned how to intertwine those things together so we can share that data across domains. I have a deep technical background, I've got a deep um, data and political background, and I have about four years of health policy in uh, California. I also um, uh, sit on the publicly funded, the board of directors on the publicly funded charter school is one of the highest performing charter schools in state of So we fly back to do that. So not only is the health and human services and the data my love, but um, education and outcomes. And I mean, and thinking about these numbers is just, it's horrifying. So, I'm thrilled, thrilled to be here. I'm Don Woods, I'm the Office of Child Care. Um, and I, I think the piece that I bring is that kind of that program model, knowledge and expertise about the field. We know that you know, when children hit kindergarten, that's kind of often our first touch point. They're entering at something that's publicly funded, which is where you can start getting those unique IDs, starting to get those test scores. And we know that through Head Start and Oregon, there's those earlier touch points, early intervention and child special ed, but there's a whole a, a ton of children out there that through the health care they're maybe in, but there are a lot in those private entities, or they're at home, or they're at a friend's, at the neighbor's or grandma. Um, and so thinking about how we take those real critical years that we know are in that early childhood and think about where those kids are, what those settings, what those experiences have been, is only going to help us um, identify where those interventions need to be and where we need to look at. And so, um, particularly like the race to the top and the effort of looking at children, particularly children with high needs, and really getting them in those quality settings to have, give them that chance for better outcomes and intervening early. When they, and the workforce, we know those interactions are so critical. It's the early childhood educators that are making a huge difference <coughs> children and what are their needs and requirements. So what do the programs look like? What do the teachers in those programs look like to make better outcomes for kids? And where have those kids been? What have their experiences been? So we can start understanding what makes a difference for a better child outcome. So I think for me, thinking about the quality rate improvement system, thinking about the workforce and how all that interconnects makes it exciting to be able to think, oh, that child was in this program which had this star level, these are the attributes, these are the characteristics to start understanding those pieces. So having those hooks to know and understand the facility, so to speak, yeah. is exciting. So I, as we move forward and meeting systems for different reasons, how they all come together um, to answer some critical questions is exciting and hopefully I can contribute some of those pieces of understanding at the ground level, so to speak, where I'm Cy Smith. I work for the state CIO and the Geospatial Information Officer. Um, I think the 
I haven't been involved in any of this, as you all know, I've never seen you before. Mm -hmm. um, but as I'm listening to this, I'm thinking, well, a couple of things from the CIO's perspective. Uh, policy alignment. There's a lot of policy out there. And, uh, as you, uh, things that happen in the legislature often um, get cross, at cross purposes. Um, so a lot of policy gets developed that conflicts with a lot of other policy. And nobody seems to pay much attention to that until it's too late. So that's and one thing. And the guts award for this meeting goes to Cy Smith. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, uh, and, and uh, I'm assuming I'm talking about Um And then, you know, there's perhaps some assistance that we can offer with in terms of integration with other systems. As I'm listening to this, I'm thinking, well, you all certainly have your arms around the um, need to bring other health information and or even employment information, that kind of thing together. I think, I think one of those students, as you said, expressed an interest in being involved with employment. Um, but it seems like that there might also be a need at some point for environmental information that would have an impact potentially on learning and um, economic information. And so there are other systems out there that you know, we kind of touch in various ways and might be able to help in terms of connections and integration. Um, and then as I think about the locational elements to this, um, I was just at a conference last week where the head of the uh, Dartmouth uh, School of Medicine was making a presentation about the impact of location on health around the country and how if you're in a different place, you get different health care. Um, and I remember my, uh, some of the that was working on my back told me that Typically in the Northwest, when you come in with a disc problem, uh, you get surgery because all the back surgeons want to live in the Pacific Northwest. <laughs> Somebody had a hammer and they had something there. Um, but location has an impact on educational opportunities as well. And so, in terms of, of that, there's the visualization of the data in terms of location for policy and planning purposes for us and others like us out there that are in government and, and in the private sector, nonprofit organizations and so on. And then there's visualization for the public. And then one last piece, we're working on uh, an executive dashboard for the governor's 10-year plan. And the 2020 goal, of course, is the one that this all flows into. And there are objectives under that that roll up into that. So at a high level, um, and, and one of the reasons that I'm working on the executive dashboard is um, the idea that we want to be able to see where things are happening or not happening, and then be able to take action on it. And we want that at a level that um, the governor or uh, his policy advisors or legislators or their staff can open it up on a pad and look at it quickly every day and see what's happening and look at a map and a picture that makes it quicker to see what's happening, what isn't happening, and be able to take action on it. So this kind of data, the SLDS data, is potentially something that needs to be connected in the I'm Mike Rebar from Oregon Department of Education, sitting in for my boss, Doug Kosky. Um, I, I may, may well be in most of these meetings, but I'm not here, Doug, Doug will be. Um, I'm from the Enterprise Systems Group, and we make data move. That's going to tell us what we need moved and when it's appropriate. We make that happen um, to handle data modeling, database architecture, integration, and so forth. And I hope um, my role here can be to help advance data standards conversations. I mean, Data governance conversations. Once, once we come to come to Cambridge and data governance, um, we'll be able to work faster and, and better. Um, the IT work is technically challenging, so this will be very technically challenging. It's not part of the I'm Nancy Johnson Dorn, uh, Oregon Department of Education, and I think one of the reasons I'm on this committee is because of my work with early intervention and early childhood special education. But I also have a 
a lot of interest in education for young kids and to look at, um, I, like, I know what I want to know. And what I want to know is what works and how much of it do you need to make it work and how to make a difference in the lives of these children. And then also to be able to, um, to look at how they do through the school system, through grade benchmarks. Um, we can take a look at kids and how they did in an OPK program, and we know that. Then we can look at how they do on the kindergarten assessment. And then we can take a look and see how they did at third grade benchmark. I would be very excited. Mm -hmm. I'm Bobby Weber. I'm a researcher at Oregon State University. And my area is um, early learning and development, where I've spent all my time. And I, in terms of the data, I've been working on it. I was just sitting here thinking, I guess I started in the 80s when we were trying for the first time to get uh, data systems that would enable us to answer, give policymakers information about where children are in Oregon, how many facilities there are, how many people work in this field. It's a, the early learning and development part of early childhood is predominantly small businesses that are some of them totally invisible and, and some of them regulated. So my area has been uh, developing, understanding, doing extracting data to do research with these multiple databases that exist within early childhood. So I think that's what I bring. I have a strong knowledge of uh, the data systems and so and both the national level and the state level are very involved in projects, um, data governance, data standards, uh, trying to, QRES um, is, and for us it's meeting race to the top <laughs> requirements, requires us to bring data from multiple databases to produce uh, accurate ratings. And our systems were never created to uh, to do this, and they were created for very specific administrative purposes to license childcare facilities or to uh, be a professional development registry for the people who work in it. And so we're involved in this process of uh, both nationally and in Oregon, um, uh, working on data dictionaries, trying you know. I think we're up to about a thousand variables that are captured in all these databases. And so I think, anyway, um, people trying to make sure that what I think a number of people have said is that the hard work of governance gets done so that the end result is when we answer a question, we're answering it accurately and reliably and um, that people can trust the, the answers we get. And so the question um, for me is this work is going on kind of horizontally and vertically, both nationally and at the state. It's not been connected very well within the early learning and development world. Does everybody know when I say early learning and development, we're talking about child care centers, preschools, daycare centers, whatever you call them, and the people who work in them. And um, very little child data is in the, the this system. When we get child data, we pull it from DHS to do research uh, you know, projects. But there's not very, very little data co ever collected by anybody on children who are in these early learning programs. If they're not earlier intervention, Early Childhood Special Ed or um, Pre-K, they, they're not, their names, their teachers' names are in systems, facility names are in, you know, information is in systems, but the children are not. So that, um, I think that's a, another reason. So I, I think what I bring is, well, I was a practitioner also, so I understand that I ran almost all these different kinds of programs in the early learning world, parent ed, and child care centers, teacher training. Um, but so 
what I bring, though, is an understanding of the data systems that exist and what's in them and the challenges of getting accurate information and the work that's being done nationally and in Oregon to be sure that when we do a QRIS rating, <laughs> it's accurate because um, the whole system will blow up if we start rating child care facilities and, and doing it with inaccurate information. Somebody's going to you know, get hurt and then they're going to be angry and so we've got to, we've just got to do this work to be happy. I'm Rob Saxton, I'm head of the Department of Education and it's really simple terms on here because John to ask me if I would do this. <laughs> <laughs> um, but more, uh, I really think that, well I know that, the outcome that we get from any system is the outcome that that system is perfectly designed to deliver. And I heard that was really eloquent in some of the outcomes that we have in Oregon. Two of them that uh, really eat at me are that we have a 68% four-year cohort graduation rate. And 68% four-year cohort graduation rate, which means if you are a freshman in high school, there's a 68% chance that you'll graduate with your class four years later. If you're a student of color, your odds are 55%. Those are two really big data points. And our system is perfectly designed to have 55% of our students color, of color graduate with their class in four years. It's perfectly designed for that. Every part about it is perfectly designed for that. And that's a really, really uh, terrible statement. And what it says about you know, sort of our capabilities and who we're going to become as a state over time scares me to death. Um, and more to the point, um, the students are all really capable, and it's the system that's failing the student, not the other way around. So we have to kind of, we need to get at that. Um, I was a high school math teacher, a high school assistant principal, high school principal, superintendent of two school districts in the state, retired for the last seven years, and I've been the head of the Department of Education for almost 363 days, <laughs> uh, almost a year. And um, so, so I've kind of had a different look at that. And the, I loved being a high school teacher, loved it. One of my favorite all-time jobs. And I left doing that because I felt like um, if we could design up systems and run them with fidelity that were better than those that we had in place, that we could change outcomes for kids collectively. And um, I thought that I might have something to add to that conversation, and so kind of started up this path unintentionally that brought me to this place. I still believe all of that the same. And I think that we in this room have an opportunity to design a part of the system that can help inform the rest. And right now, we, we um, are in a place in the state where we have an alignment that has never existed before about being able to implement a P through 20 coordinated system using evidence-based best practices to change outcomes for kids and change who we will be as a state over time, collectively. And who our kids are going to be individually, who our adults are going to be individually. Um, and we can do that. But right now, we're taking our best shot at the program that we ought to implement implement with fidelity because we don't have all the data pieces and all the pieces of information that are required to know that, that the resource and the effort that we're putting into this is going to be spent to best effect. And we cannot allow that. So we need to collect these resources up and spend these so that we don't waste the others, which are the much more um, difficult to marshal and to gain traction around. But I know that we can gain traction around those. We are already, and we're going to continue to do that. I want to make sure it's the right engine to create that traction. And the only way we're going to know that is when we can get this done. So um, I understand that. I hold it as absolute truth in my heart. And um, I kind of understand how parts of the system work and some of the big picture of it. And I just want to be here to support the work of the people who really understand how to make this data come together and create the 
a desire to cause this to happen, give it this, this support and uh, uh, you know, sort of the moral uh, requirement to cause it to happen. Thank you, everybody, for sharing. I, I think it was really worthwhile to take time to do that, um, to start us off. We are running a little bit behind. I want us to take a break, if you will, for maybe five, seven minutes, <laughs> if you can. Um, and then I want to make sure we address the kind of more timely, urgent topic that I was glad we had the opportunity to start with this bigger background to place the next conversation. So we can join back up in a few minutes. So I'm going to have all of us, we're going to get back to our... Great. I'm glad you're going. Thank you for me for having me. To really interrupt you, I want to make sure that we get our last uh, agenda items in. Let's see who else is here. Um, so I'm going to let Catherine introduce her in just a moment, but I just wanted to um, frame this conversation a little bit. I alluded to um, the envisioned role of the home visiting work um, in the first ELC data system work group. Um, and Catherine plays a significant front and central uh, role in that. Um, and the reason why we brought this forward um, to this conversation today and so urgently is a couple fold. One um, is uh, Catherine and her team came and presented the work of the Home Visiting Data System um, to a committee. Um, it's a joint committee between the Oregon Health Policy Board and the Early Learning Council, and then again forward to the Early Learning Council. And it was felt that uh, there was a need to understand kind of where the vision left off a year ago, what work has moved forward on the home visiting front, um, propelled by a grant timeline. Um, and how we come back together to synthesize where we are and where we need to go forward. Um, and so that is, uh, it was a request um, from Pam Curtis, the chair of the Early Learning Council, for us to take this on and to provide really direction and feedback on how to move forward. So I'm gonna um, hand it over to Catherine, who's gonna walk us through the home visiting data system work uh, to date. Um, we're gonna make sure to spend some time for questions um, that you may have for Catherine. And then I would like us to come together to really start um, forging a way forward of how we see next steps um, for this work. So, Catherine, if you want to introduce your role and then get started. Catherine Roderick, and I manage the Assessment Evaluation Informatics Group within the Child Health and Oregon Health Authority. Um, and that group, the Maternal and Child Health section, um, has a grant called the Maternal Infant and Early Childhood Home Visiting Grant, which we fondly call MICD, uh, for obvious reasons, um, which um, is funding this project, however, was not the impetus for it. This idea was already on the table, there was collaboration going on, and progress being made, but as you know, it really helps to have the money to do it. And so when we were able to get the federal funds, that helped us. But to use your um, metaphor, <laughs> I think this metaphor is going to live on. Um, what, what we were kind of doing is we're building a freeway ramp in a field with a timeline of like tomorrow. <laughs> and we don't know where the freeway is going or what the freeway looks like or exactly who's building the freeway. So we're trying to meet that deadline while try to connect up with those folks who are thinking about building that every way as, as best we can. Um, and so that's why I appreciate Dana allowing us to come and talk about this probably out of sequence with what your group would normally do, but we are on, to say an ambitious timeline would be uh, an understatement. So no, we're not going to build the system with uh, wooden blocks, so that would be a lot easier. Um, and I won't go through this. You, Dana's already covered the ELC's data system goals, but the point is they align perfectly with the home visiting data system goals, which actually were identified you know, a year or two prior to ELC doing so. So that's a good sign. We're all on the same wavelength. And ditto the shared objectives. I'm not going to walk through those. 
But basically, all the objectives of the early childhood system are the same objectives. We want to offer the best possible services and have them targeted to the, you know, the families that uh, they're most matched to, and have data accessible in real time, and so on. Now, the other commonality is that the domain areas, and I, I know this may have morphed a little bit in the early learning counseling work that you've done lately, but they really align the areas that you all are concerned with and those that we are. And we've, you know, we've begun identifying metrics and outcomes for those across the home visiting system, which we have tried very, very hard to anticipate where you all are going with that so that they will line up. Because the last thing we want to do, again, is build a free run ramp to nowhere. Um, so here was the home visiting data system implementation plan. Um, basically to identify home visiting organizations' needs, their, their requirements for a system, reconcile their common requirements, their outcomes, and their data sets. So this is data standards um, in another uh, way of phrasing it. And um, then design a data model, which um, delineate the home visiting data system specifications to the degree that we can then go out and select a commercial off-the-shelf software application, uh, which could be configured to the home visiting data system specifications. Um, then the plan, and in fact what we were funded for, was to pilot the home visiting data system with a subset of home visiting providers, specifically the McV grantee sites. Now just to give you a little snapshot, McV funds evidence-based home visiting models. And in Oregon, those are Nurse Family Partnership, Early Head Start, the home visiting portion of Early Head Start, because there's also facility-based. Um, and Healthy Families Oregon, also known as Healthy Star. And there are some sites, eight, throughout the state that are funded through NICV. Obviously, there are many more sites of, of those models. Um, but so the pilot, because it, it would be able to be tested in all of those types of programs, and the system would be designed um, for that diversity, um, would then be a good way to gauge what worked, what didn't work, what needed modification. And then the plan is to roll it out to all home visiting providers. And if you all choose you know, to learn the lessons or take whatever pieces of this are helpful for the early childhood system, that's even better. Um, so the progress to date. Um, we have done a great deal of work on ascertaining the needs of home visiting service organizations who are also early childhood providers and have a lot of commonality. What do they need from a data system? And in fact, what are they using now? And how is that working? What works, what doesn't? We've also identified shared high-level outcomes. Uh, again, a very collaborative process, as you've mentioned. Trying to do that, bring folks together and look at the different ways they collect data, how they define it, what they want to measure. Um, we've, we've engaged in that, not just across the McV models, but all home visiting organizations. Um, and have come up with some high-level outcomes. Obviously, they'll all be tracking their own um, specific outcomes as well. We have defined a data model and data standards and worked closely with the folks at um, Alder and SLDS, ODE, uh, these guys, uh, all of them, uh, extensively to ensure that we were on the same way. Because the last thing we want to do is go in a different direction, which is really not good for anybody. Um, and we've also researched what exists out there in terms of commercial off-the-shelf software and uh, who are the vendors that are offering those products. We did a request for information about a year ago um, and got um, quite a response and since then have also been contacted by a lot of vendors because they realize this is something that there's going to be a big market for in the future. We just happen to be just a little, you know, nose under the tent. But, um, there are a lot of big vendors, many of whom I'm sure you're familiar with, that are very interested in um, doing a pilot, however little money we have to offer. Um, so here are the key findings. Um, what the users told us 
number one priority, elimination of redundant data entry. Now, I gave this presentation or variation of it this morning to a group of about 100 visiting providers. When I said that, literally, they cheered and went like this. <laughs> so um, that was really good uh, affirmation of the fact that we really have got that right. We heard them. On average, we did a little research on this too, our home visiting providers entered duplicate data or very similar data into five different systems. So imagine a small nonprofit home visiting provider entering data into five separate systems, very similar data, one of which is still paper. Um, and obviously those systems don't connect, none of that. Um, think how many more kids they could serve if they weren't doing that. So uh, second uh, key finding uh, in terms of user requirements was that they absolutely need flexibility at their level to modify the system. They need to not be able, not to have to go through an external entity to do this because as you all know, many of these are small nonprofits, not, um, not a lot of money, uh, but have changing needs. I mean, we, you know, they're reporting to many different systems and that changes. They get a new grant, somebody has different reporting requirements, or their protocols change, or, the, or they try a new evidence-based practice or intervention. They want to collect different data. So they need to be able to make those changes at their local level in a fairly easy way. And last but definitely not least, um, the requirement is that this system offer not just reporting capability, but care coordination and referral management because those are key for them to what we've all talked about. Uh, efficient, increased efficiency and effectiveness and return on investment, determining what works and what works with whom and what groups might we be leaving out in terms of um, certain kinds of interventions that are actually effective for them. So th that's the bare minimum. What we found out in terms of the vendors is that there are multiple software products out there capable of meeting the user specifications. Now that's with customization or configuration to our specifications, but there are products out there that look like they would work. Um, secondly, um, vendors do tell us and obviously it would be a requirement in the, in the request for a proposal, that they do have the capability, that their, their software has the capability to connect with other data systems, which we know we have to be able to connect with or this simply won't work. Student launched new data system. Um, electronic health records, maybe it doesn't happen today, but when electronic health records are, are have the capability to share data, we have to be able to have that on ramp to get the data. So those are some of the things that we've looked at in terms of the vendors. So that all adds up to the requirements for the system include a shared standard-based, standards-based data set. Uh, it needs to have customizable um, capability for each of the early childhood providers program specific needs and they differ uh, considerably. It needs to be a mobile option. We're talking about home visiting. They need to have a device in the home um, or in their car or wherever it is they're um, working with a family. So that means it needs to be web-based. And lastly, um, it has to include all the most common current functions that they're using. So they don't want to add a new system onto what they're already doing. They want to be able to retire their legacy systems because I didn't hear anybody out there said that they have a fabulous system that they never want to get rid of. Um, so, these are some of the most common functions, and they're the ones that we sort of alluded to here. It, very importantly is the one that we had some discussion about regarding ID, uh, a single ID, so that we can link across systems. And we have to be able to identify the family constellation, which, as you all know, changes. The child is at home with mom, the child goes to foster care, the child goes to grandma's house. Um, so uh, we have to have a capability to do that. We have to have uh, screening functions, referral management, eligibility and enrollment, registries. We have to have charting and care plan uh, capability. 
service statistics, information about what services were delivered. We have to have billing information. Many of these programs bill through a variety of systems um, that they have to replace if they're going to replace with they're, what they're doing now. We have to have the capability to query based on all the kinds of things that you've expressed interest in and produce reports easily. We have to be able to evaluate outcomes and the quality um, of what's going on so they can do continuous quality improvement as well as report to policymakers. We do need to have provider ID, you know, their training, their credentialing, like we talked about with QRIS. Same thing for facilities, that has to be built in. And we have to have um, the consent and privacy management capability so that there are access permissions. Because the data is all sitting there. Who can see which data has to be built into this system? Okay. So just to give you a little run through of, of what we've modeled, and this is really, um, it's not a live system, although we have this in FileMaker Pro, for those of you who care, where it's actually active. But I'm just giving you some screenshots to give you a sample of potentially one child moving through part of the system to see what we're talking about. Um, but this is really a mock-up, and it was to help both our users see and visualize what they need in terms of requirements and to say, well, this will do it, that won't do it, I need this. And then also as a tool for when we do go to the request for proposal so the vendors can see what must be included. So won't be in these colors, won't look just like this, but this is a mock-up to help us all visualize what we're talking about. So. Uh, the process begins with a referral, let's say in this case from a primary care provider, and it comes to the home visiting system, can come electronically, data's all filled in, gives you the reason for referral, they don't have to duplicate, enter this into another system. The home visiting supervisor receives the referral and assigns a client to the home visitor. Now you can see across the top there are a bunch of tabs, I'm only showing you a couple, and each of those tabs has lots of complexity. So you're seeing just a you know, we're just scratching the surface, but it gives you an idea. And this screen would be configured and would look like and include the data that each of those providers want. So if I'm a, um, in this case, I'm a public health nurse supervisor, um, this is what I want to see on my screen. And we've actually cut off some of the screen on the right because uh, we wouldn't have been able to see everything that's on there. But it'll track who, who was this uh, child assigned to, when did it happen, where did the initial referral come from, um, et cetera. And then the home visitor screens the child. So it goes to the home visitor electronically. The home visitor pulls it up on their iPad in the field um, and says, OK, I need to do an ASQ for this child screening tool, standard screening tool. Um, and identifies in the course of that a, a suspected developmental delay. So this records that screening. And I'm only, again, using ASQ as an example. This would be customized, but you could include any assessment tools, any screening tools one wanted. Um, and it could appear in different ways depending on the provider. But it can include the results of, the, of that screening tool or assessment. You can actually scan in and append the tool, because as many of you know, those are copyrighted. So we can't, you know, there are certain things we can't do with them. Um, but we need to have them there, so that anybody else who's working with this child can then see it down the road. They don't go, did it happen? They don't do it again because they don't know, um, et cetera. They also know at what intervals it occurred, because for some of these screening, uh, screenings, it's important that they be at certain intervals, and that tells us a great deal about the progress the child is making. So there's a lot more data here that I'm not even going to talk about. So then, it's determined by the home visitor, based on the ASQ, that the child should be referred to early intervention for evaluation and appropriate services, potential referral to additional services elsewhere. So then we get this screen that shows where and when um, that referral took place. Importantly for the person who's doing this work, this has the capability, and it's actually off this screen right now, to provide notifications to the original referral 
source, the secondary, the tertiary, that goes ding, ding, ding. What happened with Janie Doe? You referred to EI six months ago. You know, then it'll say, well, the EI saw this person and visited and developed this care plan. Um, and EI can get notifications. You can get them in the way you want, at the frequency you want, etc. Um, so, pretty exciting for the home visitor who's no longer going to have to track this on their own on paper. Um, and again, let me just go back to that though, because it's important to note that you can only see this data if you have the privacy permissions to do so based on your role in this case, and that's all. Uh, contained in the system. So lots of data available to people who handle the case, but again, only if they're eligible to see that data. So an important feature for those folks in the field, can sign the consent documents right there in the field and manage consent documents because there are multiple. Um, it can be signed right on the iPad. Um, and then someone else can also see um, what has been signed? You know, did this mom consent to, or uh, caregiver or guardian um, consent? Um, and for what? And this is, you know, the form content is, that's gobbled goop. Uh, it's just an example. Obviously, there would be much more um, in-depth content there. So then refer, referring providers can track the client progress. So they can go back in and they can pull up a screen, they can do it by child, they can do it by whoever they referred things to, they can do it by date period, they can do it any old which way they want. Um, but they can see what happened with that child. So for instance, if that primary care provider um, referred, the ASQ was done by the home visitor, say, um, the primary care provider can look at it and go, okay, that was the result. Um, mom is coming in for an appointment. I can do counseling based on those results. I don't have to do it again. Um, and I know what's happened between that ASQ and my visit with the mom. Again, assuming they have access um, based on the privacy. Okay, and for the family, they can see what appointments and referrals they have in the hopper. Um, they can do that on their own computer. That could be put in, that could be texted to them. The, the home visitor can sit with the iPad and go over it. They could be printed out, mailed to them, given to them. Um, so they can see sort of status, not just of appointments, but this is an example. And they can also see, well, pending referrals you can see on the bottom. So if there are referrals and they were going to call so-and-so, um, it can be a little reminder. Okay, so importantly, if you remember back to the user requirements, and what we found is users want to be able to add data elements because they change all the time. We won't get it perfect the first time. And um, so those uh, providers want to be able to track new data elements. And these are just examples. But they could, it's very easy in this system to add whatever data elements today they think would be important. And then, of course, they can pull data based on those. Um, and supervisors can get management reports. And again, they can, this is an example by types of referrals made. So when were they referred, who was referred, the referral from, to reason for referral, and what the outcome or status is. So a manager might want to, you know, look, well, were they referred to something related to schooling for the parent, or getting a driver's license, or mental health counseling, or alternative housing, DHS self-sufficiency program. Um, so they can track, so they can, they can, you know, for continuous quality improvement or management purposes, they have that data. They have a whole lot of other data, but this is an example. And last but not least for this group, policymakers can get outcome reports. And this is just one example, but I know it's a topic that's of keen interest to you all, which is of, you know, how many children who are served by early childhood programs um, get screened, get screened appropriately of those children based on that screen, who are candidates for referral, you know, what percentage is that, what happened with them in terms of where they referred, was the referral completed, are they making appropriate progress. This is 
you know, condense, obviously, not just because of the screen size. But there would be the opportunity to quarry, certainly at the aggregate level, everything. And uh, again, looking across at the child level, looking across at the facility level, our provider level, um, and looking across the whole system, or by geography, which usually we can have a lot of interest in looking at some of those geographic differences and um, across our state. So that, in a nutshell, and it's it's really skimming the surface of the capability um, that we're looking at, is what we want. Um, so the impact of this will be that providers will have tools to coordinate care and follow appropriate protocols, improving outcomes for kids, which is you know, the whole point. Um, and families, providers, managers, policymakers will have timely, because this is real time. They don't have to wait for the data to come in, don't have to wait for a report to be generated by somebody else. They will have this at their fingertips. Um, We'll have timely, accurate, because it's standardized data, um, and it hasn't gone through five different, you know, on paper, into this system, into this system. Timely, accurate, standardized information for whatever sorts of decisions they need to make. We'll also have very much enhanced uh, ability to, to discern the effectiveness of specific services, and not just that, but specific services for specific kinds of families or needs that are out there because not every service is the perfect fit for every family and we could learn more about that and that would help us um, with this last item which is maximizing return on investment um, by providing data to guide policy decisions. Um, so those are the impacts that we see and hope for and have designed this to do. Um, so what are our next steps? For us, the next step would be to issue the RFP. That's really pivotal next step. Select the vendor, configure, have the vendor configure the software to the provider requirements that we've identified. Train users, pilot the system with, again, the McD grantees. This was written into their grant that they're doing that. Um, and they have a set of common outcome measures they have to track anyway based on the grant. So that's very helpful because um, we can also pilot that. Um, and then roll out to all of the home visiting providers um, after that. So that's it as fast as I can do it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and um, please ask questions because I know that's a lot um, on a very complex topic. I have a context question. Sure. Um, so in, in the course of a about how many kids are visited through this program? Well, these are mo many, many programs. Right, through the home So all, the, all of the home visiting system, you can probably tell me that better than I can. Um, I mean, what I'm going it's for, on the thousands. Oh, it's, it's in the, like, I don't know, like 100,000. We can get, we actually have numbers. Okay. The thing is, I'm familiar with, with the, the McVie and the public health home visiting. For instance, just for the McVie eight sites that began serving a year ago, um, and so they just ramped up, you know, they didn't add all their families at once, they've served over 650 families just in those eight sites. Um, and that is, you know, there are hundreds. Um, I mean, what I'm driving at yeah. is, you know, there's about 240,000 kids under the age of five. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I'm trying to get a sense of how many of them are, are, is this program mm -hmm. reaching? So, well, uh, right. We can, we can we'll park like that yeah. question. So I did a scan with Krista from my talk this morning. Oh, okay. We got 26,000. Okay. Um, but I don't know that we got that we're coming this thing. So that was. And that's, that's um, children per year. So if I were a hub and I was using part of my money to use to access these services, or more correctly stated, these services were provided within the geographic parameter of my hub. That's the right way to say that. Then I could say, okay, in addition to the outcomes you've got, I'd like to have the outcomes using the unique identifier requirement 
to tie to this. So that can be an added dimension that they could do and then it connects in that way. And that's actually what we, we've been working on for a couple of years with these guys to ensure that we aren't going like this, right. that we are going in the same direction and that we have the same notion about days. Because that's exactly what we're doing. I mean, part of why this is so important is should know our numbers, so we should know the number of kids. But exactly, but when you all don't the have system. when you when you lack a system, you can only approximate, and that makes it really hard for us to understand return on investment, and it also makes us understand how we can get more children connected to the services that they need. We can't, we don't even know exactly who's getting what we have right now, and we can't tell who isn't getting services exactly. that might need services or might best benefit by services because we do see disparity is significant disparities that equity in services is not what anyone has been able to see. So I'm gonna just I wanna frame kind of how I hope this conversation just because I want to be thoughtful about 35 minutes when I'm hopefully we can get through a lot of discussion. Um, so I, I want to make sure that there's any questions about you know the technology, the vision, the that what um, Catherine has described right here for a couple minutes. Um, and then, of course, Catherine will be on hold if there's more questions that come up, but I'd like to engage the committee in a conversation about understanding where we've already described this morning the needs of the early childhood data system as part of the larger data system for the state that we've articulated. There's clearly um, well-articulated needs of the home visiting uh, service delivery model and how it fits with the broader state vision. But I also expect that there could be a delta there in the differences and I want us to start to artic articulating what those might be and how we forge forward knowing the timeline for the home visiting data system and what they've called out as their next steps to go to RFP. So if there are, are there any questions kind of about what Catherine presented about the home visiting data system? And that might not be a natural cut, but I just mm. thought it might help us move forward in this conversation. One of my simplest, sort of simple. One of my simplest questions would be: You identified really clearly what it was that um, home visiting folks wanted mm -hmm. in the system. Mm -hmm. um, does that make it? If it's what they want, does it make it what the system should be? I know that's sort of like a way, um, simplified question, but mm -hmm. um, sometimes those two things are not one and the same. Sometimes what people want it to be because they sort of want everything and they want everything sort of customized just for themselves doesn't necessarily mean that that's the right thing to give them for the entire system. I'm asking are those two things the same? And there isn't that's a really, a, a nice really straightforward mm -hmm. answer to that, except that um, if what, what our intent was behind this system, as I understand the intent behind the early childhood system, is to provide a tool to help them do their job better. In other words, tailor interventions to children and do better coordination of care. That we know we do want to include. Um, and, and there's actually nothing that folks expressed that they wanted that didn't line up with what, and we've been tracking very closely, and we're, you know, work very closely with the Dick Alexander group, um, and you all, to try and make sure we were on the same track. So that there's nothing that I'm aware of that diverges from what um, a larger system might want to see. It's really that tool for daily work, to improve the daily work, you know, the capacity to pull outcomes that can drive policy decisions based on return on investment. So if I can step in, I think um, we don't know everything that we need right now. We can't sit and say, well, if you modify the home data system, the visiting system to do these things, then we're going to have everything we need for the Because we don't have those data in a, a, a place. And what I see is that the ability to have a system like this to give us some view into what's happening in the landscape is going to help us ask the right questions that as we move on to what our permanent system is going to look like, then then we will have that better information. But until we pilot, until we're able to collect the data, until we're able to look at it and say, are, if by understanding what these encounters are and what the referrals have been, and being able to take
take some of the human services data and say, well, did they actually make it into those other systems and, and ask those deeper questions. We're not going to know um, the full breadth of questions that we need to ask the answer, or we need to ask or answer for early learning. Um, my personal thought is that we have an opportunity to begin walking into the waters. We also have an opportunity not to marry ourselves so hard to say, well, this is what it is, this is the only thing it's going to be. But to thoughtfully look at the data as they're collected and then help that guide our own questioning and where we might go from here. We've got to start someplace. The other piece is um, you hear horror stories of millions of dollars that are spent on systems that somebody said was what we needed and were defined. And then they were such a mismatch with the people who did the work that they create alternative ways of doing it, stick with paper. Um, so I think I, I would reframe your question. I mean, because asking the user how they work is a fundamentally smart thing to do in building a system um, because it's going to get us better outcomes and it's going to save us money. So the horror stories I've heard, some of which are Oregon, is they didn't talk to the users. They built, they spent the millions. The system, the users simply couldn't do, use it. It wasn't that they were being obstinate. It just didn't match the workflow. And then we spend more money fixing it so that it can be used. So I just would reframe it to, I think that's good practice. Um, in data governance, data management, you know, design work is, in fact, you know, these papers that I read about data management say the users have to sit at the table, the users have to be engaged for this reason because so many millions have been wasted. Anyway. No, I think it's the right thing to ask. I just, mm -hmm. um, I just don't know that it's the right thing to you know, always. Um, so it, it deliver on every single thing that was asked right. for, oh, right? Yes. Because right. so part of my question would be: so they say that they want to be able to customize it. What does customization mean? Um, because if people begin to customize it to a place that it makes it not usable from one place to another, then I have a big problem with that. Because um, that was one of the big things that they said: they want to be able to customize it. Well, what do you mean customize it? I mean, lots of different kinds of customers. The, con the core con yeah. the yeah. Ele element. Because you know, then I start getting really nervous. That's, and that actually, just to clarify, because actually the informatics team would tell me I should say configure. Um, but um, the customization that they would be able to do at the local level would be to add on like, the data elements we're talking about or pull in different kinds of reports. They would not be able to change the system for other people but to have the capability, to the extent of their ability to do it, to, um, to add data elements or pull different kinds of reports and make it work for them. So what we're talking about is a core set of data that everybody will have. Right. And the ability to add additional data that are specific to the way that one runs one's own business. So, so yeah. the focus then is that, that we're interested in is that core set of data the carrot to get people to use it are the additional ones that they can add, so that they then don't have to say, well, I've got my own system over here, and I can't do these kind of things, or I can't track hair color. Or we don't care about hair. As long as it's still mineable, and it's still right. transferable, and not what that is. So, so um, are, I want to see if anybody else wants to bring up, are there any opportunities that we haven't articulated, any pitfalls that we haven't I'm certainly not a technology person, so um, I can't understand feasibility and how this all fits within the vision that we described earlier. So I just want to open that dialogue up. I'm not sure if this is exactly along the lines of what you're asking, but to me it, it seems to make sense to uh, move in this direction it, for the reason you stated at the beginning of the meeting, you know, to, to make some progress, to wade into the water. But I think in doing that, we would also be well advised in having a very clear mental map of how and when we would transition from this to the, the larger vision that we're trying to accomplish. 
so as to say, you know, we could easily get get stuck here too, and not be able to get to the the, the broader thing. And you know, and so that's you know, I, I think having a very clear, at least vision, if not timeline and construct around how to transition from whatever this would be to the, the broader, to meeting the broader vision, I think is an important factor. And picking up both Andrew and Rob, I think what it's some group to get to the next step, to really an integrated or a comprehensive early childhood data system, some groups got to do the same kind of hard work that this group has spent a couple years doing, uh, which are the common elements so that we're going to do the same way, and, and there is an, and there's a standard, and you know, so I, I, th I mean, I don't have a map for how this group is going to move, but somebody, the real work, I think several people have said this, the real work is not the IT. The real work of building this system that we want is real life human beings agreeing to which are the core elements that have to be defined to these standards. And I assume that that, that we're probably not the group was going to do it, but that that's, uh, that's a part of our charge, as I understand the charge, is making sure that gets done. And it does feel like um, this contributes to it. It's the beginning. It's right. it's a beginning of the conversation a broader group needs to have. Right. I think that the way I, I agree. I think that the frame is a little different, though. It isn't that we're starting with the home visiting model and we're building up from there. It's more, with all due respect. I think this is tons of work that. The hub prospects will be very excited to see, mm -hmm. as will the work that you all did. We'll be very excited to see, maybe in the webinar setting or wherever. But the frame is: here's the OEIB. They got the whole piece, P through 20. They got the statewide longitudinal data system. Then the hubs own a piece. The hubs have an accountability to deliver a result to the P through 20 system in one set of domains, and they need to connect to the statewide longitudinal data system. They also need to be able to look at the providers in their sphere of influence, not just their funded providers, mm -hmm. but people affecting children in their geographical area. They need to look at what systems they're using. Ah, great, home visiting is using this system. Can this system connect to that system and provide the data results that the hub needs to be accountable to the ELC for the investment made? So to me, the kind of good news in all this is it's not all painting from scratch. It's not starting from scratch. It's the architecture starting to be built. Some of the frames are there. We need to make sure that the rooms go to the next room and not, you know, that you can't get out of your bedroom and get to the bathroom or whatever. We have to have the right architecture. But the job is to get the right architecture and connectors. And if the hub says, we, I mean, it's conceivable to me that a hub would take this frame, this stuff, mm -hmm. and say, gosh, that's so darn close. We want to add these six things to make sure that it gets to where we want to go. We're going to use all the work they've done for adding six things over there. And you guys can keep going with whatever you're going. We're just putting in six more Legos, and we're there. So, so that's the hopeful thing to me. And I think the parameter to address your issue is the hubs have absolute responsibility and need to be clear. You have to have this core data. You can do all the bells and whistles you want. You can tailor this thing to ring your alarm clock in the morning. But at the end of the day, if you don't have client level outcomes, if you can't connect to these other systems, you do not get to build the road in the first place because you're building a freeway off ramp to nowhere. So I think there is, the hub has a, bench, a, a vested interest <coughs> in a core set that is inescapable by anyone no matter how much they don't like it. Or and maybe helpful to a bigger systems conversation since they since we necessarily, to get the RFA out, have to identify the core kinds of services that ought to be coordinated as part of a local mm -hmm. early learning 
system, and I think that that uh, will potentially evolve over time since these are demonstration projects technically, but it provides us at least a starting point as a group to just look and say, okay, these are the kinds of services that are being coordinated locally, what's the data that is associated with that, and how do we start to build a system that tracks it in a relevant way that connects to the entire control system. Um, it's easier for me to take a step back just because I'm not deeply involved and um, I think standards that term keeps getting thrown around and there are multiple layers of standards and one of the key things to be able to go across different areas is to start realizing the different layers of standards and how we have to define it and possibly in the state CIO level because there's content standards there's field length standards, there's transport standards, um, and to the point where maybe you don't have to build one-off interfaces point to point that everyone's built these certain standards so that you can transmit information in a way that doesn't then make it so you're always having, oh, I have to build something unique to how you have your data set up. It's just universal. It's almost like how do you build um, a building in Oregon. Well, everyone knows the policies because they're defined for the electrical or the foundation, how far apart the posts are. So that, to me, is where the state needs to go, um, is defining more of those standards and publishing them and making it available to the public. So that way, in smaller organizations set up systems, whatever the shell is of the care coordination tool, it doesn't matter because the data can Share it easily because it's all formatted the same way for transformers. Lisa, well, can so I take that thought and turn it back just to think of how to bring it? So, we are obviously not there yet, yeah. and you're articulating a great vision that I can understand. So, vis a vis where we are right now and decisions that have to be made, how do we reconcile those? And this is for anybody, well, but I. So, I think that we have an advantage with this particular system because of the work that's been done mm -hmm. already. And um, I think that uh, given where we are and how quickly we want to move, it would really be a, a mistake to just say, well, we don't have today. We really need to support moving forward. Um, taking in the thought that we need to make sure that this isn't just, okay, good, done, check the box, move on, but we need to keep our thoughts moving forward. And then again, rolling in over time the standards and that sort of thing. So um, my recommendation is, is that that we continue to say, go forth, do good, um, you have our support. There's some mechanical pieces that, that we're working on at FHA in order to get to our control agency for approval of the IRRs. And, and, um, but those are the only things from a, a process perspective that are stopping putting out the RFP. And I think what, what we're looking for right here is um, we're ready to run. Do we have the full thumbs up so we can just run? So, so Carol, is there a way that you write the RFP so it's more likely to be? I mean, is there something about the RFP? Have you already written it and it's done? Or is well, there something about the RFP that can be drafted so that it makes it more likely to not have a system that is going to connect? Yes, and I believe, from what I've seen with the RFP, that, that uh, because the data standards are already considered for the education data standards because we're looking at, um, uh, I'm sorry, Fletcher, I'm going to bring this for you. But um, we, we're looking at open architecture, we're looking at um, uh, the requirements being the ability to share data in multiple ways. Um, I think that we've crossed that hurdle with an eye toward what we have to do to connect into the systems that education already has and to connect into the other systems that we have in OHA and DHS. Again, understanding it's not the end all and be all, but it is the opportunity to take a first step. So I want to ask a clarifying question because this is the level that my brain functions when it talks about technology, so I want to check those people <laughs> in this <laughs> conversation. So I heard, and I think Whitney actually spoke of it well, in thinking about moving forward um, to, uh, to make a business case for the larger data system was, trying to um, define, are we talking about one big system or are we talking about interface of multiple systems? And my understanding from this conversation is the latter, and that this 
you know, moving forward with the RFP for the home visiting is one of those opportunities to interface then with multiple data sets that will go towards our goal. Is that an accurate way that I'm thinking about it? Just want to make sure. So we're not, back to I think how you described it, we're not talking about starting with home visiting and building out this huge system under the home visiting, but it's a connector. Okay, this, and I'm probably, well, what we're can make fun of myself for my ability <laughs> to talk at a technical level. We're looking at the good work has already been done. And that whole realm of data, OIT is already plugged in in some minor ways. Being able to continue to plug multiple data sources in and normalize across so that there are questions that we don't even know we need to ask. Mm -hmm. And making our data systems as connectable as possible so that we can ask you know, what's the effect of this upon this upon this if that, that we didn't even know about the if that. So, and the takeaway would not be from doing this, from this rolling out, that, for example, the relief nurseries say, well, are you telling us that the hub's frame is the home visiting nurse right. model? And the answer to that question would be, no, we're not telling you that at all, mm -hmm. as I understand what we're talking about here. Also being in the non-data world, I mean, the non-technology world. But that's an important piece. We're not saying this is way off to do it. Right, but what we're saying is, um, home visiting folks are using this tool. They have the ability to connect with different provider sources. They have the ability to track referrals. This information is very valuable to you as part of the hubs. That's, um, if you're interested in connecting with that conversation. Yes, plus I would even go one further, which is it's clear from just what we've seen that there's a good starting point for this frame, which is in people's homes and portable and easy and on an iPad instead of a laptop and other. Then mm -hmm. the, also yes. look at this as you're envisioning what you're gonna do. Yes, I would agree. Would you, I'm speaking for you. Yeah, also. absolutely, because it, it can be used by folks that want to. Right. But even among home visitors, we have no way to mandate it. I mean, some that we fund and we've written mm -hmm. it into the contract, we can mandate that they use it. But ultimately, as you said, I think earlier, it's a carrot. Mm -hmm. It's the carrot is you've got five systems, one of which is paper. You hate it, and you can't get your own data back out in a meaningful way. So for the most part, folks are going to opt for something that works better. Now, if somebody has a system that they love, and it's doing everything they need in the way that they need it, um, then maybe they would just, you know, we just figure out how to connect with their system. I think the number of folks in that camp are probably small. small. So the McV grant mm -hmm. would fund the development of this mm -hmm. system, mm -hmm. that's right. So it's not clear, I'm, I'm trying to understand why this group would have any sort of bearing on whether that, how that RFP works. So I think the intent, again, it, is back to the metaphor. <laughs> is that yes. to develop, yeah. right, to develop additional silos that don't connect with each other, that aren't heading the same direction is the wrong way to go. And the fact that there is a jurisdiction might not be the right word, but the reason why they're at the table is that home visiting agrees with that and wants to be part of this broader vision. They brought so, themselves forward. Yeah, I'm them. just trying to unpack that. Yeah, so that volunteer. The same. So I think to that point though is, and you know, frankly, this is a conversation that is not specific to data systems. It's crossing the you know the universe of health and human services and education is an outcome and how we all reinforce our activities towards a, a shared vision is this is where it becomes less clear in jurisdiction and governance but I think we need to call that out right now and I think and Catherine should share differently I think what the vision would be when we had our first ELC data system group we articulated this vision for the early childhood data system piece of the bigger that will connect to that, the Early Learning Council would have oversight over this. And then there would be a early lear a steering committee, this group. And then there would be the hard work that's happening on the ground to develop it, which has been what's been going on in the home visiting. And so I bring back, I think, the intent, and I want to check people's agreement with this, that this group will serve We're as sorry. Your conference is ending now. Please uh, hang up. Probably should not have gone all that time. Anyway. <laughs> that, that, and we can talk about if there's, you know, people that need to be bring on to this group with respect at the stage that we're on with home visiting, but that we would serve as a, 
a immediate steering committee for that work going on and that there will be not just this discussion and move forward and we're not talking to each other but there will be a iterative process of working together and coming back to us and understanding what's going on and helping to think about how to connect that work to the bigger. Yeah. And you guys wanted that. That's now exactly what we wanted. Yeah. Well, the last thing we want to do, because we're all about trying to coordinate with everybody else, because um, our folks, our home visitors, those kids are seen by all kinds of different folks in the early childhood system and some of those providers you're talking about that are specifically early childhood. That's what we want. Um, and so that's why we've been in these conversations again, even before the early learning council yep. came around. So, um, or the McVie grant funding. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, I, I think there's a unanimity of opinion that that's what people in the field see as needed. Yes. So, Lynn, you said the term early childhood system. Yeah. called enterprise architecture that, that many of the IT, in the IT community have been involved with for a while, but it's really goes beyond IT. And it really is about designing something like the system that you're talking about, designing all the aspects of it, just to be sure that you've got everything in your frame, as you said, um, so that the governance is a part of the architecture. Policies are a part of the architecture. Standards and specifications are part of the architecture. Um, the IT systems are part of the architecture. The business processes and the workflow are part of the architecture. It's not that you design all of that. It's just that you put it all into a frame and you understand that these are all the pieces and parts and this is how they connect to each other so that you've got it all uh, on the table. And as you move forward, you don't move forward with a system that isn't all connected. In this case, you wouldn't want, absolutely wouldn't want to stop doing anything you're doing. So you're, you've all heard the analogy of uh, designing the plane that you're flying it. Um, that's kind of what we're talking about doing with an architecture. I mean, you need to put that architecture in place as things are happening um, so that you don't have to slow those down. But they will begin to be affected by the architecture as you move forward, depending on where they are in the process. And that's, I mean, it just seems like a, maybe a small group of folks that have that expertise and more people in other states that have that expertise ought to be um, tasked with putting that or beginning to put that architecture together. But I, I do think if you reflect back on the beginning conversation that, that there are uh, some funds available have a limited to yeah. um, start the design process and the conversation. I think that that's where that happens. Okay. Um, and then that moves into what are we going to do for uh, whether it's a, a wraparound type of a build, so we're filling in blanks that are there, or whether there's a rebuild of certain things. But what I'm seeing with this particular system is it's buying us some time to do that planning to um, figure out some of the more longer term solutions, not that this will go away, but there's going to be, I think, a, a, a larger infrastructure, both technology and business infrastructure around what we do going mm -hmm. forward. But we have to have this beginning piece so that we can have the view into what's happening on the ground and how effective are the referrals and who's being touched. And particularly when we're talking about our most vulnerable children, which are the ones that our home visitors are seeing. And if we're well, and, and I think politically, it's you know not that any of us ever worry about politics at all. Um, but politically, it's very, very exciting to be able to say, we've started something tracking early learning data results right now, funded by grand dollars, and yeah. going from there as opposed to, you know, trying to build the airplane at all, you know, or, or, I'd rather prefer to be building the bicycle as you're rolling down the road. That's <laughs> <It's> not <laughs> frightening me to be in the air that trying to build it. Yeah, so, but I, but I don't want that to be lost on us, because there is yeah. a real gun to the head here for mm -hmm. early, uh, provable. We have to deliver. We have to deliver. So. Yeah. And we have, and even if it's incremental, we have to. Yeah. Carolyn, are you thinking that we have to spend a little bit of money on the architecture piece too? While we're so what what I'm thinking is that, and my view of enterprise architecture is a little bit different than the boss of you. And I would have to get up and do it on a whiteboard for everyone to see it, <laughs> uh, and trying not to mix in it. We're getting a little bit short on time, but um, the conversation really starts with 
from a business perspective, what is it that we have to accomplish? And then because we're government and we're so data driven, what data do you need to know that you accomplish this business? And then what systems or processes do you have to collect or connect the data to know that you accomplish the business and then you apply the technology to that? So we're just at the point where we're talking about what do we need to do from a business perspective? What is our business? What do we need to accomplish? And we're beginning to have the conversation about the data as a role of it. And if, if they don't already exist, then how do we get them? We, we haven't gotten to the more classic architecture, technology architecture discussions yet. We're really just looking at what's available and what do we have to do, and then how do we begin to create those linkages so that we can get to those outcomes and be able to speak about the outcomes that we want to see. So, I'm going to try to wrap this up and articulate, I think, where I understand we all sit and where we're headed. I wanted to just, to you, Rob, and particularly given our conversation and, and your vision of how this links um, up to the, the business case that the state is about to embark on, the larger data system, and anything you, any thoughts that come up that we should take away with that, that bigger picture. I mean, we're, we're talking about the bigger picture in green in all of this, but. some guidance on that type of answer. <laughs> um, it's, it, it. Well, I do, I will say, I think some of the work, so let me just take us uh, moving forward. What I'm hearing today is that we all feel very comfortable with moving and helping to support move forward the home visiting data system mm -hmm. to the next stage of the RFP. Um, and so we can work on that after this, but that's where I understand us to be. And then to, we need to, uh, to establish this group as a government, the immediate steering committee for that work, um, and we'll think through about this group and if there's any additions given the context of this initial work that we're looking at. Um, and then we need to, as a group, also understand our role within the larger work that's going on, and so I'll be doing some background work um, with many people to understand how we support, facilitate, and connect to that larger work. Um, and. I, I expect that we will be meeting on a relatively regular basis. I haven't figured out exactly, maybe every other month right now, I expect a meeting in September. I'm throwing that out there, I don't know exactly, but I just wanna put a place and uh, there's gonna be for sure an ongoing touch point with the work on the ground that's happening, as well as I know there are other topics that are gonna be coming forward. For example, um, we have, a, significant funding to develop a data system around workforce development and quality child care. So our QRIS race to top funds need to have this similar conversation and again it's going to be on a fast timeline and I'll have to think about how what the role is of the steering committee for that as well. Um, and we'll work with Rob to think that through and Jada and Pam. Um, so so I think we have our next steps. Carolyn, were you going to say something about the RFP step? Um, well I think that one of the other things too that I think understanding that this group's given a thumbs up and being able to communicate that back to DAS and the control agencies that this is uh, important. Uh, we've got control documents that we need to get through that we're working on right now, uh, and we need to do that before we can get there. So if the group can help in any way, it would be. So I'm gonna be articulating that back to <laughs> the council and Pam, um, who really put our charge forward, and I think we can, that would be similar information that we share. So are there um, any parting thoughts uh, that anybody wants to share kind of 
hopes, uh, wishes that we would come back to address. I, I took a lot of notes in our earlier conversation about, I think, some topics that we will reconnect. And again, I want to fit it into the broader conversation. So this unique identifier conversation, um, there's a lot. Um, and I've taken active notes on things that we need to come back to. Um, but I just want to have anybody, I don't think we need to go around given our time, but is there any additions that people haven't voiced? I'm just wondering uh, at what point, what if, if you connect with, um, don't go there, <laughs> but, like anything with um, ASQ Online. Right. I mean, some, the, you know, some sort of connection with um, online screening data. Okay. I'm trying to think how that might connect. That you would know things that had already been done, you would see the screening information here, you'd have that connection. I think one of the things, that, a topic that I, I would like to bring back to it, there's a lot of mention of, there's a big conversation around this work across systems and agencies about the need for in exchanging information, real-time provider to provider who's serving a, a similar uh, child or client or family. And I, you alluded to a lot of potentials that this system might be, but I know that there is a huge amount of consideration to go into that for next steps. That wasn't really necessary for today to move this conversation, but one in which I think that I call health information exchange, it's client level information exchange that we need to come back to thinking about. And is this the way we build it out? Are there other opportunities ahead? I think developmental screening is a really clear and simple example, but there are many of that kind. So I would say that there are probably numerous efforts underway. Yeah. And we don't know what we don't know. And being able to um, reach into our own agencies and agencies that have the potential to be working on the same kind of thing, begin to catalog those efforts and um, find uh, the most promising ways to work together with the work that's already being done without disrupting the work of um, our partner agencies. And I'm thinking corrections, for example, what we've got going on lot of efforts, even just workforce, there's a lot of efforts going on. I think we need to understand what that is and then how those do or do not apply to the work that we're charged to do, not try to solve the entire world's problems, but focusing on um, what do we need to know for early learning, what do we need to know to make sure that the child is best prepared to hit kindergarten, um, and the interventions that are most important with the child and family moving forward, but really a good survey of what's out there. Is going to well, us. and I think it's critical that the hubs, when they're formed, are engaged in that, because yeah. there's a strong um, desire for this not to be a big-ass model, yes. but, a, but a big outcome model, not a big state model where it's prescriptive, but where if you're in Wheeler County, you can decide it's going to roll this way, and it doesn't look like anything anywhere else, but it works in Wheeler. So I, I don't I can do that. Yeah. And I think this is this gets us on that track. So Well and I just think as far as to keep the work moving, because there is a lot of work moving that I heard kind of almost like a lot of principles that would keep to make sure that things are connecting at what our core values are for this system that would allow the work to continue um, with the vision down the line. And so I don't know, Dana, if in your notes those might get teased out, but that would be helpful for kind of people that are working on it, make sure that those right steps have happened, because people don't necessarily know them, um, to help people move their work forward. Sounds like a good agenda item for future meeting. Any other party comments? Wishes for next? Just like to thank you all for the support of the system. We're pretty excited. Thank you all very much for being here. I'm really excited Thank about you. this group coming together.